So Nitro, number 116, also December 1st, 1997. Let me give a history lesson before we start this. So on this day that they taped this show, the idea was that at Starcade, Eric Bischoff was going to win control of Nitro. And Eric Bischoff was going to rename it NWO Monday Nitro. And WCW was going to move to Thursday Nights. A brand new two-hour Thursday night show. So when you hear how everybody was reacting to everything, it's kind of funny, as we'll get into. And of course, that's not what happened. They ended up keeping Nitro on Monday, and they gave us thunder. (laughs) The the venom in your voice as you say that word. Sickening. So in my week off, I missed another Sting fell from the rafters. Oh, wait, it's just a dummy segment. Mm -hmm. Really? They had to do this twice? (laughs) And they waffled him in the head with a bat. Yeah. So they said Larry Zabisco had lured Eric Bischoff into accepting a one-on-one match at Starcade. But then Gene brings Bischoff out for a promo. Bischoff says, no, 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 no. I have no contract to wrestle Larry Zabisco. I offered to fight him last week. And it never happened, so that offer's done. The only way, he said, he would wrestle Zabisco is if WCW is willing to put Nitro on the line. But he knew Larry didn't have the power to make that happen. Gene repeated this to make sure the fans at home understood, and it was done. He didn't stretch it out over 20 minutes for no reason. Larry went off on a rant about how they had made a verbal agreement on national television. Juventud Guerrero versus Rey Mysterio Jr., this had to be the worst Ray Hoovy match of all time. Am I the only one? I was watching the first few minutes because Hoovy is one of those guys who is not as good as I remember. Because I only remember the cool stuff he did and not the lead, the, the, the great amount of stuff he fucked the up. The other 80%? Yes. So I'm watching this like three minutes just waiting for Hoovy to fuck something up to an epic degree. Right. And it's going along fine. And then Ray fucks up. Right. <laughs> Ray does the thing where you're running the ropes... And your head slips under the rope, and you come up with your throat under the rope, and you nearly die. I don't know if this was the one, or if he did it again, but now you know why he always hit the middle rope. Yes. Because he was trying to hit the top rope here, but he was too short. And so he missed, and he snapped his head, and he ended up selling his knee, but I don't think he actually hurt his knee. I think he snapped his neck and he needed time to recover. Yes. And so Hoovy decided, I'm going to put you in some wacky leg holds. Yes. And well, they were wacky. It's a good thing he didn't work the neck. You don't want to work the neck. Exactly. No. Yeah, Ray did this because he was short. I did this once because I was just that clumsy. Dude, I did this in our first match. Yes, you did. Yeah. I suspect pretty much everyone who's wrestled more than a couple dozen matches has done it. Sucks. No, not this. I hit the middle rope. Mm-hmm. I see. Like a mini. No, I meant sl- your head slides under the top rope and you come back and... How the fuck did you do that? Yeah, You're nine you feet that? tall. I was that clumsy. I never did that. I did that. I was, I had more matches than you, I'm pretty sure. Probably. I honestly think Worse it would take a great deal more. of coordination for you to be able to pull that off. I don't know what to tell you. Did you trip? Possibly. Huh. <laughs> I just can't even imagine I have this. forgotten the how. I just remember the what. Were you running and- on your knees by any chance? <laughs> no, I was definitely not doing that. Trying to figure out the physics involved with this. I picture I picture Vinny doing the Eddie Guerrero spot where he's running across the ring on his knees. And is bouncing. <laughs> but then he slips and necks himself on the ropes. That makes more sense. Yeah. So anyway, uh, they did, Eddie was on commentary here, by the way. And he was great because while he's pointing out all the cool shit they are doing, he is also pointing out how he would have countered it. <laughs> I thought it was awesome. Yeah, he was Frank Mir. I guess, yeah. <laughs> So, Hoovy hits the uh, Mitch Noku driver for a near fall, and Ray comes back and wins with a very scary West Coast pop. I thought it was a very good match. I thought it was a match. Mm. I thought it was really good, actually, Brian. I guess I'm the guy, as usual. 
Wrath versus Hugh Morris. Anyone want to tell me this was good? This was not good. It's not good. This guy ran the WWE Performance Center for years. Yes. Right. So Raven and his crew showed up at ringside during the entrances. It's only went like three minutes, but it was still crappy. By uh, the way, this is the second week in a row that Lodi's been out there, and they haven't identified the man. They, don't know they his, couldn't figure out what to call him. They don't know his name. They, they acknowledged him. Yeah. They said, there's that guy again with the signs. They probably thought he looks like Billy Idol. Let's call him Billy. Ah, oh, fuck, we got a Billy Kidman. <laughs> What the hell could we call him? I don't know. Just throw him out there. Who gives a shit? That sounds like a very WCW conversation. <laughs> I'm sure that's exactly how it went. So, Vandenberg distracts Hugh. Hugh, while being distracted, is constantly looking back over his shoulder for the kick he knows is coming. The kick finally comes. It looks like hell. Uh, it did set up Wrath doing a flip dive off the apron, which tells you how strong Hugh Morris was that Wrath trusted this guy to catch him. It's true. And then Mortis put a chain in his boot. Vandenberg takes the ref. There's a lot of shit that happened. In that three led minutes. To nothing. Yes. Hugh Morris just moonsaulted him. Yes. yes. I only bring this up because, well, A, it's my job, but, you know, Vandenberg has the ref, and Mortis is on the apron with his foot on the top rope pointing to his chain on the toes. And Wrath and Hugh are like doing a collar and elbow. And Wrath looks over at Mortis. And he looks the other way to see that Vandenberg has the ref. And he looks back at Mortis and all he can do is nod, but it should have been a wink and a thumbs up. I like the idea that when he put his foot on the top rope, that wasn't enough. No. He also had to point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My foot. There it is. Right there. So Mortis throws a kick and Hugh ducks and Wrath goes down. And Wrath goes up top, but no, that's still not enough. Vandenberg has to climb up top with him, and R- Hugh knocks him down. And after all of this, Hugh just hits a moonsault and wins. This is way more shenanigans than were needed for a three-minute match. Think about this. There was a horrible match involving Wrath, which was immediately followed by a commercial for Saturday night telling you that if you tune in on Saturday, you could see Glacier versus Ernest Miller. What? Huh. Yeah. Aren't they, aren't they buddies? Apparently they're wrestling on Saturday night. Interesting. Bischoff and Hulk Hogan came out for a promo. Hogan called people numbskulls. He did. <laughs> I will say this, by the way. Uh, if you're watching this show with headphones, the Voodoo Child knockoff sounds much cooler. Than Jimi Hendrix? Well, no. Okay. <laughs> but cooler than it sounds without the headphones. <sighs> Vinny, I was about to ready to hit you. I know. I would have deserved it. Anyway, the point was uh, they're selling sting masks and they want you to buy them. <laughs> so they had everyone in the crowd with sting masks on and they zoomed in on everyone who had them. It was about one third of the people, at least on the hard camera side. And Hogan says, all you people are in denial. You don't realize Sting's a coward. He threatens to fight the entire audience. He leaves the ring to confront a granny. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> He did. Yes. Yeah. Not the granny. No, not our granny. But a granny. A granny. And, like, I'm 98% sure this was a plant, but I don't care. But she was there the year before when they were in Knoxville. She was always there right. in the front row. Yeah. I don't think she was a plant, but, I mean, obviously she was part of the show. Oh, yes. So, the stare down between this granny and Hulk Hogan, and then she began to throw punches at him. And then she started, I don't even, doing like cat motions at his face. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't know what the hell is going on. But Hogan is perplexed. <laughs> Tug Tillinger is there, I guess, to protect Hulk in case anything goes wrong. Bischoff leaves the ring to tell Hulk, uh, I don't know what she's doing, but do not touch this grandmother. <laughs> and then they just go to the break. <laughs> I was laughing my ass off. I loved every moment of this. It was old school, campy heel stuff, and it was great. Yuji Nagata versus Prince Ikea. In a match. I was going to tell you, Vince, last last week he had come back. Prince Ikea, that is. Yeah, thank God. And they were saying that he had been on a five-week tour of New Japan. Yeah. And I made a crack that maybe New Japan was very desperate. Mm-hmm. Dude, New Japan is using Billy Gunn. That's true. Today. Yes. But as I watched this match. He was good. Prince Ikea improved. When he was on a tour of New Japan. Yes. He Shocking. had a very, very good match with Yuji Nagata. My, uh, as soon as this match was announced, I wrote, is this necessary? Then I watched this match. Yes. This match was necessary. I needed to see this. 
They had a very, very good wrestling match. Lots of chain wrestling, which all looked good. Prince makes his comeback with chops and kicks, but Yuji cuts him off with a belly to belly. And they go fight up top, and Prince knocks him down, hits a big body press for the win. A professional wrestling match this was. That was very good. Faces of Fear versus Harlem Heat. Oh, man, I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you what happened in this match. First off, Jimmy Hart's there. Jackie's there. Ming and Barbarian are there. Harlem Heat are there. Bodies everywhere. Jackie at one point goes after Jimmy Hart, which gets the biggest pop of the whole match. So she's beating on Jimmy outside. Booker's running wild in the ring. And he makes a cover on Barbarian, and Ming breaks it up. So Ming is a barbarian himself. He's a crazed savage. But he breaks us up with an old-school double sledge. Keep going. I really enjoyed that double sledge. I love that double sledge. I watched it twice. <laughs> I was like, that's how he broke it up. He raised his hands high over his head, and he sledged the man in the back. I think Harlem Heat won. I don't even remember. <laughs> okay. All that matters. Let me get to what matters. When it's over... Ming just keeps going on a Godzilla tirade. Yeah, this last week, too. He's doing the Tongan death grip. One of Harlem Heat gets a wooden chair, and he literally Tongan death grips through the chair to the man's neck. He takes him down to the mat. He's just running roughshod. And then he looks outside, and he sees that Jackie is beating up Jimmy Hart. And Ming gets out of the ring, and he just starts, he goes to get her. Like, he's going to eat her. And she just runs for her life. I loved it. I remember the time people hated the Ming push. They hated it. They absolutely could not understand why do they always make Ming into such a killer. He's horrible. That's what people said. Dave gave his matches duds. I mean, come on. But man, looking back, he was so great. I understand why they pushed him. I'd have pushed him. I'd have made him my world champion. God, he was great. It's not too late. It's not! So the finish was, four-way breaks out, Booker ends up on Barbarian's shoulders, Stevie Ray kicks Barbarian in the stomach so Booker can do a victory roll, but as that is going on, Ming don't care about the pin, as Brian said, he just goes after Stevie and Tongan death grips him to death. But I think the pin was the victory roll. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, so Harlem Heat wins, but I was just left wondering, if you're going to have this ultimate unstoppable monster Meng who defeats two men with his tongue in death grip why not just let him win the match as well the outsiders came out for a promo best sign I've seen in months they were in Knoxville Tennessee and a fan holds up a sign that reads NWO WCW hell no this is Ron Wright country <laughs> that's a lot of words that's a lot of words Talk about how great Ron Wright was in 1997. Almost 98. So, Hall does his survey shtick. Nash says, WCW is Lee Harvey Oswald, and the NWO is Jack Ruby with a gunshot to the stomach. Yes, he threatened murder. Of everyone, apparently. Scott Hall versus Disco Inferno. Disco was coming off the loss to Jacqueline, and the NWO was not even humoring him <laughs> with any kind of dignity. He got about, he got one flurry of punches at the very beginning, and they squashed him like the biggest geek in the world. Oh, man. Scott Hall beat the shit out of him in the corner. Yeah. It was great. The chops he was using. Oh, I love this match. Yeah. He used a choke slam, started making fun of the giant, and they pinned him with a razor's edge. And then, just to put the cherry on top of the Sunday, the Outsiders did the most cartoon, exaggerated celebration of this, like jumping up and down and pumping their fists, <laughs> pointing out to everyone, this was nothing, because Disco is nothing. Oakland interviewed J.J. Dillon, who got right to the point, said that Larry could not put Nitro on the line, but he could, and he was booking Bischoff versus Sabisco at Starcade with Nitro at stake. Bischoff ran out to protest that Dylan, Dylan didn't have this kind of power. Dylan said, yes, I do. Then no one said anything for a while. Then it ended. It was so amazing about this was, as we noted, originally, when this show was written, Bischoff was going to win. 
And so when you watch this segment and you just see J.J. Dillon out there and he's just got this big grin and he's cackling and the announcers are laughing and they're all expecting Bischoff to lose, it was all being built up where they would all be absolute fools and Bischoff was going to win in the end. It was so fascinating to watch this. And of course, at the end of the day, Bischoff lost. But it was very funny watching how this was designed when originally he was going to win. All I know is they should have never shined a spotlight on Larry Zbysko because he spent the next hour talking about himself on well, yeah. every match that he was doing, quote-unquote, commentary for. I'm trying to remember now. He had one. I forget, he had some great line on this show. And by great, I mean terrible. Ultimo Dragon versus Psychosis. They mentioned, the announcers did, that Ultimo Dragon's daughter had undergone abdominal surgery in Mexico City and was now on the mend. It was good news. At the exact point they told this story, Psychosis does a slingshot leg drop from the ring over the top rope to the hard, hard floor. All I could think was, this man must also want abdominal surgery. This is the same move that the... Uh, Italian. Yeah. Johnny the Bull. Thank you. Tore his, tore his u- urethra. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Don't do this move, people. No. Do not fly out of the ring and land on your ass on the floor. He immediately starts holding his back. Yeah. And his hip. And his hips, his pelvis, and his tailbone. <sighs> and back and forth for a while. Dragon one with a spinning top rope Rana and the dragon sleeper. Cool. Close from a nitro party. You know, let me, I got it. I knew you guys, I knew, uh-huh. I knew what was coming. But it's time for me to defend the Nitro Parties. Not this one. Nope, I'm gonna. Oh my. These dudes were total complete geeks. Uh Uh-huh. But you know what? These guys were having a Nitro Party. They were having a huge get-together to watch Nitro. There was eight people there. And there were a lot of them watching it and having fun. So I was totally fine with putting this on television. The show was cool enough that these people arranged a party on a Monday night around watching Nitro. Now listen, I realize they're geeks, but let's imagine a Microsoft Christmas party. Really? There's going to be a bunch of cooler guys hanging out than we're here at this Nitro party? Let's imagine the Safeway down the road having their Halloween party. A bunch of total dorks. I have been your Safeway. There's that guy with the afro. That guy was cooler than anyone in this, this <laughs> Nitro party. Let's imagine your dentist and his dentistry office getting together for the holiday party. Dude, Nitro Bunch of dorks. for everybody. There's dorks everywhere, is my point. There's no. no group of cool folk that are out there. They're all well, geeks. That's a fair thing to say, actually. Yeah. Like these wrestling geeks or any bigger geeks than any other group of geeks. Now your cabinet-making cacophony of goofs. <laughs> Gotta be a bunch they're of geeks. They're far more entertaining, that's for sure. I'm sure they are. I'm sure they but do don't me. tell me they're not a bunch of geeks just like these Nitro Party geeks. Okay. Imagine radio hosts doing a Christmas show. Bunch of fucking geeks. Yeah, that's true. That's a fact. All right. Now let's talk about a non... Well... Don't defend this. Can one. I edit that out? <laughs> Listen, the match was fun. Chris Benoit destroyed Kidman. Yeah, destroyed him. Supposed to be Chris Benoit versus Raven, but Raven announced although he had signed, he made the rules, and he would wrestle when he said so. He was not wrestling tonight. He was sending Kidman in to to, uh, do his work for him. So Kidman went in to wrestle. (laughs) Wrestle? He went in to take a glorious beating. To absorb blows repeatedly. (laughs) Chris Benoit, who was a very good pro wrestler, beat the holy snot out of him. It was greatly entertaining. He would beat this man and then go to the corner and call out Raven, dare him to come fight, and Raven would stand in defiance. And eventually, Kidman was able to... uh, They were brawling on the floor, and Kidman yanked Benoit into a lariat from Saturn. He followed with a shooting star press from the apron to the floor, in 1997, mind you. And uh, I figured, okay, he's going to put him in a hold. Benoit will make his comeback and do the finish. Considering their respective places on the WCW totem pole, Benoit gave him a ton. Kidman got a lot of offense here. Finally, Benoit makes his comeback, gets the cross face, and the flock attacks for the uh, DQ. Oh, yeah, no, he did get the submission one first. Then the flock attacks. Benoit attacked them all, fought all of them off until the giant hammer hit the ring. 
And Hammer and Benoit had a stare down, but that was just a setup. The, the giant, giant hammer. hammer. <laughs> Edit that out. <laughs> oh, no. Well, <laughs> the large man who referred to himself as Hammer hit the ring. Had a stare down with Benoit. It was a setup for Raven to attack the Benoit. Giant hammer. <laughs> DDT. Had a stare down with Benoit. He's pierced too. He has a giant pierced hammer. That's right. That's true. You're right, Craig. Yeah. Glad you noticed. Well. Make it kind of obvious. Let's just cut to the chase. Please do. Is there anybody that can more believably beat up five men than Chris Benoit? No. <laughs> it was amazing. Maybe Brock. And I interpreted Raven's look outside as a man who just thought, what the hell did I just get into here? <laughs> that, that's possible. <laughs> He's going to chop me really hard. <laughs> I've made a huge mistake. I need more flunkies. I also noted that Raven is Jeff Jarrett. Yeah. How so? He really is. It's the same storyline. He wrestles He's who much he more wants, entertaining than Jeff Jarrett. He, wants. he is more entertaining. I will give him that. All right. Uh, the hell were we? Lex Luger versus Buff Bagwell. This was a good match. Buff Bagwell was very good until he broke his neck. Uh, it was similar to the main thing where I thought, if you're going to put a guy over this strong afterwards, why not just let him win the match? Because you see, Lex is running wild making his comeback. He hits the power slam, calls the rack, Vincent hits the ring, and Brian, here's something you've always complained about. As soon as Vincent hit the ring, the ref called for the DQ. Good. Even though Lex killed him. At yep. no point was Lex in danger. Yeah, he never laid a hand on Lex. No. Because you're not allowed to have an extra man get inside the goddamn ring. Then they need to keep the rules consistent, Brian. Why are you telling me this? I've been arguing this for years. I know. I can enter the ring with a gun, but as long as they don't pull the trigger, it's okay. Absolutely. That's stupid. <laughs> you hear me? Stupid. Anyway, Lex ended up racking Bagwell and Vincent anyway. Yeah, Vincent successfully went up for the rack. That's the most notable thing of this match. I didn't think he'd be able to. I thought he'd somehow fuck it up. And you know what's weird? There are all sorts of stupid run-ins in WCW. But the fans were totally, completely satisfied with a horrible DQ because Luger racked both men afterwards. Multiple on one show, by the way. That was literally enough for them. That's true. They like this, Lex. NWO did a, their own hype video running down DDP, basically showing everyone in the NWO laying him out repeatedly. And then we got Paige versus Kurt Hennig in the main event. They're doing this match, and totally at random, the ref goes down. Do you know what happened yes. here? I assume the fans hit him in the eye with a bottle. So, they're doing this match, and Randy Anderson just collapses. Mm -hmm. And you can see Kurt Hennig, he's in control, and he looks over at the guy, and he's like, what the fuck happened? He's holding his head, by the way. Probably thinks, did this guy like have an aneurysm or a heart attack, or why is he down? So he immediately takes DDP to the band, and he puts him in a long chin lock yes. to find out if Randy Anderson's alive. Some fucking fan Aha. threw a golf ball oh, and beamed him right in the head and fucked him up. Yeah, that'll do it. And he managed to finish the match and everything like that, but he was messed up. And this is what happens when you encourage the fans That's to true. jump the rail and throw shit at the ring. Yeah. You can't do that. A golf ball. A golf ball. It's maniacal. So, yes, the ref goes down, holding his eye, and all three men are down laying there as they determine, is this ref okay to continue? Can we keep going? And eventually he survived, and they did. It was still mostly just sleepers and chin locks anyway. And then Paige makes his comeback when Rick Rude comes down. And then Paige hits the diamond cutter. And then it becomes, I believe, this is the exact same finish they did for about two years in a row. Where they do the main event, the baby face is his finisher, and the NWO attacks for the DQ. Yeah, and, the, and Rude comes down and yanks Randy out of the ring who just got hit in the head with a golf ball. That is also Throws true. Throws him head first into the ground. Bet he loved that. That was the end of uh, Nitro there. No, no, Vinny. Hmm? You're not going to talk about Hulk Hogan's fucking diamond cutters? Oh, yeah. They beat a page forever, and Hulk Hogan and it attempted to hit diamond cutters on DDP. They were poor. Craig, would you like to describe these diamond cutters? Well, he grabbed him in 
These were the headlock. goddamn worst diamond cutters ever in the history of this business. Were they worse than his figure four? No. Eh. <laughs> they weren't. The figure four where he put the top leg under the other leg? Because he was so goddamn bad he couldn't figure out how to do a figure well, four? They're confusing moves, Brian. He did the worst diamond cutter I've ever seen. And then he did a second one, which was worse than the first. Yep. It's Hulk Hogan, man. <laughs> you sound surprised. Vinny, go give Craig a diamond cutter right now. Like, no. how can you uh, not do a diamond cutter? <laughs> it's not like he was asked to do a fucking 450. Is your floor double enforced? It wasn't like he... I can imagine Hulk Hogan fucking up a okay, Sister now, Abigail. Now, now I want to. <laughs> but a goddamn diamond cutter... You grab his head and you fall on your fucking back. Why is it so hard? Why could Hulk Hogan not do anything right? He was a uh, entertainer. I understand that. <laughs> what do you want me to do? You <laughs> grab his head and you take a flat back bump. Hey, here's Jesus a news flash. Hulk Hogan, who was a wrestler, wasn't much of a wrestler, Brian. I just can't believe it. It's true. And they all mock Sting, like I'm mocking the two of you right now. We're doing another match. Yeah? I want Vinny to execute <laughs> a diamond cutter a diamond cutter on Craig. <laughs> to see if we can do it better than Hogan and I want to see if you guys can do it better. Huh. Because you can't not. Hey, you're probably right. Anyway, everybody, now that is the show. Right. And that's it. We are at war. Nitro 117, also December 8th, 1997. Larry's, Boring as can be. <laughs> Larry Zabisco <laughs> is off preparing for his match against Eric Bischoff, so Bobby Heenan, Mike Tanay, and Tony Schiavone are on commentary. I wish they'd had videos of Larry doing katas. Yeah, you know? <laughs> Maybe they do. I've forgotten. But they should. So Conan versus Ray Trailer is the opener. Let's stop right there. We saw the... I wish I could. Big Boss Man mm -hmm. versus Conan. They, didn't, they did one wrestling move. One. They stalled forever. They brawled a bit. They stalled some more. And finally, Conan has Ray set up for a corner charge when the lights go out. Not a moment too soon. For a long time. Like like a minute passed before the, light, the lights came back on. We got such helpful commentary from the announcers as, I can see heads. When the lights come on after a whole minute, Conan is laid out. Everyone else is confused. Ray puts a foot on Conan's chest and takes the win, still bewildered as to what was going on. I don't know the answer to this question. If anybody was at this Nitro, you can fill me in. I wonder if they really bothered to actually send Sting down to beat Conan up and then run away again. Because the lights were out for a long time, and there were a couple times when the lights went out that people were actively cheering. So, like, something must have been happening. That's a good question. They recapped DDP getting beat up last week. Uh, Brian, you chastised me for glossing over how terrible Hulk Hogan's diamond cutters were. Mm -hmm. So I paid close attention to this. They were very bad. Don't get me wrong. But not nearly as bad as what happened right before when twice now he grabbed Paige for a cutter and like stood there and looked around and said something. And stood there. I envisioned, you know those old, uh, they used to have like dance lessons where you put foot, feet down on the floor, one, two, three, four. Right? Yes. The Hogan was looking for the feet, and they weren't there, so he didn't know what to do. Eventually, he had a pair of terrible cutters, and that was that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. Barbarian versus Mongo. I'm going to say that again. It's just fun to say. Barbarian versus Mongo. Uh-huh. You know, what I wrote down was Steve McMichael versus Mongo, which it may as well have been. May as well have been. There's a granny in a Christmas sweater who was very happy to see the ball bearing. Let's talk about the very first spot in this match. Steve McMichael puts him in a headlock, and he stands there. <laughs> ah! And he stands there, and he stands there, and he stands there, and he stands there, and he's clearly communicating with the barbarian. And they stand there, and they stand there, and they stand there. And they're communicating. And they stand there. And finally they start moving to the ropes for their big spot. And the spot is, duck the clothesline yeah. and tackle me. I'm glad you brought this up. That was a whole spot! Yeah. Now, much like a car that needs a good front-end alignment, 
Mongo cannot run in a straight line. Yes. He, he pulls this to the right. This is what I noticed. He pulls to the right. He ducks the clothesline, but then somehow, by the time he hits the rope, is directly behind the barbarian. If, if you drew a circle <laughs> around the ring, that is the path Mongo took to run around. <laughs> to run the barbarian here. They're brawling on the floor, and Mongo is doing a terribly clumsy Ric Flair impression flopping all over the place. <laughs> They get in the ring. Here's the finish. They're wailing on each other, and Mongo grabs him and tombstones him and pins him. Mm -hmm. Well, (laughs) there was one move prior to that where the barbarian takes him towards the ropes. If you haven't watched this, I don't know why you would listen to the review and then watch it, but if you're one of those people, or if you want to go back, please please watch the barbarian's Irish whip. (laughs) Yeah. It's the weakest, lamest Irish whip you've ever seen in your whole life. He, like, slowly pushes the guy to the ropes, and then he just kind of lets go of the guy. And Mongo just starts running, and Barbarian pats him on the back, and Mongo goes away, and Barbarian just slowly lowers his head, Mongo kicks him, and then tombstones him. Yeah. That's the match. That is the lightest Irish whip I've ever seen. You know what's funny? Dave buried all of the Ming and Barbarian matches. Ugh. And let's be fair. This match was atrocious. Sure. It was goddamn horrible. They hit each other really hard. But I loved it! Yes. So, Jimmy Hart jumps in the apron. He's waving for Mang to come out. Mongo grabs him, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait. Finally, Mongo knocks him down, and Mang is there to catch Jimmy Hart. And Mang hits the ring, <laughs> and Mang and Mongo have the greatest brawl I ever saw. <laughs> they went face to face and just pawed at each other like angry bears and keep in mind mongo at one time in his life was an angry bear please tell me you've seen the video of the, the man kangaroo pun- okay yeah that's basically what this was except if it would keep that, going the, the kangaroo had better technique this yeah. was two men impersonating will uh, windmills yeah <laughs> thrown at each other just just pawing each other it was awesome finally Mang puts him away with a tongue and death grip that's better than the match Gene Oakland interviewed at Disco Inferno. I was taken aback. It appeared at Disco was taken aback because he came out still putting his shirt on and looking completely flummoxed. You know what's weird about this? How long have we been watching Disco Inferno? About a year and a half now. A year? Let's just say it's a year. About eh, about two years. For the vast majority, like 90% of the time we've been watching Disco Inferno, he's been a totally serious wrestler. Mm. He has! Okay. Am I wrong, Vinny? How many times have we watched and just been befuddled that Disco's just having a wrestling match with this guy? I, I guess... Am I the only one? He came out here and cut a very He's serious promo. He's not Dean Malenko. Well, not Dean Malenko, but everybody remembers him as all he did was dance and do stupid stuff. And yeah. that's not what Disco was. It's a lot of what Disco was. No, he's just doing matches. Week after week after week, he's doing matches. And he did a match here tonight, a serious match. He cut a serious promo here. He wasn't very good in either scenario. (laughs) But he was trying. So Gene explains to Disco, you lost to Jacqueline at the pay-per-view. You are terribly embarrassed. Everyone is making fun of you. And then he closes with, and this is a quote, Right now, your life is not a pleasant one. And he holds (laughs) the microphone out to his face like a dick. (laughs) How's that any worse than the interview people in WWE? They don't directly insult him. Yeah, they do. Do they? Yeah. All right. I think, fine, whatever. Disco was appalled at this question, said the whole thing was a joke. If anyone wanted to make a joke about him, he dared them to say it to his face. They and go he to, backed it up. After the break, Buff Bagwell comes out, ambushes Gene, and demands an interview. He runs down Lex Luger for a while. Says Lex hadn't shown him anything last week. Says, I have been held back by WCW for six years. I am stepping up to the plate. I'm calling out Lex Luger to fight me tonight. And there's no way I can lose, because I'm buff, and I'm in Buffalo. That was awesome. (laughs) And then he starts going to the back, and Gene quietly says, I believe his underpants are too tight. (laughs) Prince Ikea versus Dean Malenko. Eddie Guerrero has joined the announced desk again. There was not much to the match. They did some stuff. Malenko had a double arm backbreaker and he cloverleaf for the submission win. I was impressed with Ikea here. He's looked good the last couple weeks and came back from New Japan. They did a spot where uh, 
I okay, uh, did a springboard off the ropes and he was going to do a crossbody, but Dean ducked down and the prince had perfect timing and fell behind him and rolled him up. It was very cool. I showed I yawned reviewing it. <laughs> I was watching it. <laughs> okay. Buffalo Bill football players Jim Kelly and Bruce Smith in the crowd. Oh, Bruce. Bruce Smith didn't even get a graphic. Jim Kelly got a graphic. Mongo got a graphic. Kevin Green got a graphic. Bruce is better than any of them. He's not better than Reggie White. Reggie White is a better player, but he's the best football player they've had on this show, and they almost ignored him. Kevin Nash did a video running down the Giant saying he saying he was the true Giant of wrestling. Giant might be bigger, but Nash is better. Giant was afraid to fight Nash when he was healthy, but as soon as Nash gets knee surgery, there's the Giant calling him out. They took away the Giant's choke slam, so he was fucked, and he promised to uh, finish him off at Starcade. This is very good material, and Kevin Nash cut it half a week. Oakland then called out the Giant, who had his arm in a cast. Oh, my lord, the Giant. So if you recall at Starcade, Kevin Nash almost kills the Giant. Tries mm-hmm. to powerbomb him. Giant's 100 pounds heavier than last year. Not now. Oh, he, what are you talking about? He's huge here. I know I'm saying not now, the present day. He no, looks he's really down good. to 398. But this guy came out here and he was so... If you would have told me he was 8 feet tall and 500 pounds, I would have believed you. Yes. He was enormous. And Kevin Nash, with his gimmick legs and his skinny frame, like he thought, I'm going to powerbomb this guy. What the fuck was he thinking? What the fuck was Giant thinking? I don't know. Yeah, Giant standing next to Gene, they could not possibly have been the same species. <laughs> or there's a Photoshop or something. So he accepted Nash's challenge for Starcade, and even though his hand was in a cast, he promised to chokeslam him. What he said was, I got a surprise for you at Starcade. It's a choke slam. That's not a surprise. <laughs> like, that's a shitty surprise, dude. <laughs> it's the worst birthday surprise ever. Surprise! Ah! They showed Nash hitting a sting dummy with a bat. I don't know why this had to be aired. I guess just to reinforce what happened at the end of the show. Yes, exactly. that's why. All right. Chris Benoit versus Raven. <laughs> okay, hold on. So they bring in Lodi. Yes. And... He's going into the ring, and Tony Schiavone says, I've discovered this man's name. Mm-hmm. Low die. And he pauses for a second and like then the says, Cretan song. I apologize. It's California it's, City, isn't it? It's low D. CCR. Can you quit killing my gimmick here? Sorry. He says, It's low die. And then he corrects himself to low D. Mm-hmm. Now, the man looks like Billy Idol. Right. So his name is Idol spelled backwards. Correct. I was unaware that there's like a pronunciation that you can fuck up. Well, Lodi is a city. It's not Lodi, it's Lodi. Right. And then for half the match, he's fixated on how you must pronounce it Lodi Mm -hmm. and not Lodi. I will say the best part of this. There's somewhere in here where Bobby Heenan calls him Lodi. And Tony says, no, no, low D. <laughs> and he in response is, oh, a thousand pardons. Because <laughs> it's so stupid. Bobby <laughs> Eden was the best. You, It's just amazing sometimes. I look at companies like WCW, and they fuck every single thing up, but then there's something that you're not allowed to fuck up. Do not call this man low die. Mm. You must... Call him Low D. Then Benoit obliterated him. So listen, I know it's not fun to say nice things about Chris Benoit, but he was very good at his job, and this is one of the best squash matches I ever saw. Yeah. Oh man, just wait. Oh, just wait this, for in the hindsight, David Flair match. This, in hindsight, is the best program ever because it's just Benoit doing squash matches, building up to a match with the Raven. Great. I hope it goes three years. Raven wasn't even in the building this time. No. Well, he was sick. I see. And so they turned it into a storyline that without him, there's no direction. Mm-hmm. And the flock is fucking up left and right. Not that low D would have done all right with Raven there. He was still going to get obliterated. But listen, I have done a pretty good job trying to separate Chris Benoit, the wrestler in the 90s, from Chris Benoit, the human being. I feel I've... Tried very hard to just 
wipe that part out of my mind so we can look back and try to have fun and not think about it and try to just review these shows as if we're watching them for the first time. But then this guy cuts this goddamn promo afterwards. Yeah. I mean, seriously, it'd be way too difficult to go and just delete Chris Benoit from all of the Nitros and everything that they've got in the WWE Network. But can someone go back and fucking get rid of this stupid fucking promo? Yeah, I didn't even write this down. I didn't, I didn't write it down it. either. Yeah. And I've already successfully blocked it out of my mind. I just thought it was terribly uncomfortable. I watched it and I just could not even believe. I, like, how can you leave that in? I don't know. Let's move on. Oakland brought Ric Flair out for a promo. Flair ran down everyone in the NWO. He challenged Kurt Hennig to a cage match at Starcade. And then Gene says, can I get your opinion on Bret Hart? And Flair pauses and he gets a little smile. Now, before you say what he said about Bret... This very week, Bret Hart had done an interview, and he had talked about how he was very, very sorry about a lot of the terrible things that he had said about Ric Flair back in the day. Hmm. So what did Flair say about Bret? Flair says, Bret Hart, you call yourself the greatest of all time, and that might work when you're writing your column in a newspaper in Calgary, but if you ever find your way to Charlotte, meet up with me and I will show you the truth. He says, you joined the NWO just to avoid me. And he sucked up to the crowd and says, comparing Bret Hart to me is like comparing John Elway to Jim Kelly. John Elway, at the time, was the reigning Super Bowl champion and Jim Kelly was retired. <laughs> this is a poor analogy. Well, Jim Kelly was here. I realize that. He was trying to put him over. I realize that. That baby face pop. Did not work. Hugh Morris versus Randy Savage. Randy Savage versus Hugh Morris. I don't know. <laughs> it's Nitro. I know. It just, Nitro would just do weird stuff like this. They just put matches together. Yes. They put names in a hat, and they drew these two. Yeah. Every show is Battle Bowl. <laughs> but a legit draw. Yeah. Savage goes over to mess with Jim Kelly and uh, Bruce Smith, flips Kelly's hat off. Hugh attacks him, and he holds him so the Bills can get some offense. Oh, my. It looked bad. You know... <laughs> it was very bad. I don't know if this is what actually happened, but... I kind of think that this wasn't supposed to happen. That's kind of what I was thinking. And that Hugh Morris just <laughs> grabbed the guy and held him there, and they went into business for themselves. Sure. Because like. there's no way that they could have planned this, seen them throw those forearms, and said, you know what, let's do this on national television. Those are the fakest forearms I've ever seen. Oh, my God. Nothing comes close. Fans hitting their buddies on TV looks way more oh, yeah, than yeah, this. Yeah. <laughs> Which is funny, because most football players are nuts anyway. So let's just lay in here. Yeah, These but they guys, probably took one look at Rainy Savage and thought, don't touch this guy. That's a solid point. That guy's not right. <laughs> this guy's going to snap. This guy ain't right. That's a solid point. Because you know they probably met him before the show. Oh, yeah. And Randy Savage was... Randy Savage. Crazed. Yes. He didn't come off as a calm fella out of character. No. He was always... If you've ever seen Randy 110. Savage, quote unquote, out of character, he's still nuts. So this was every Randy Savage match ever. He sold forever. Hugh missed an elbow. Savage did a knee and a slam and his elbow and won. <laughs> just, Actually, no. He hit the elbow, pulled him oh, up at two. You were right. He hit another elbow, pulled him up at two, and then just punched Charles Robinson. Mm -hmm. Because he took the greatest bump ever. <laughs> they can't have Randy Savage beat Hugh Morris yes, here no. on television. So the lights go out again for a long time. There's electric shock noises like a Jacob's Ladder. The fans start to cheer. The announcers have no idea what's going on. Finally, the lights come on. Hugh's still dead. <laughs> Sucks to be him. But Randy Savage is laid out wearing a sting mask, and they go to commercial. Heenan said, 20,000 people cheering at darkness. I like when, I think it was Tony said, this is eerie. Heenan says, no, this is no, Buffalo. Buffalo. <laughs> Heenan was the best. Have we ever mentioned that? They go to break, and they come back, and here is where Eric Bischoff and Rick Rude came out. Yeah. Rick, <laughs> Rick Rude, uh, Brian described this in great detail earlier, but there is no question. Rick Rude is a man to be taken seriously and respected and obeyed. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> it was like the announcers did his bidding, and I was here 
covering my eyes, just put, like he asked. Yeah. He puts them in the see no evil, speak no evil, hear no evil poses. And I mean that quite literally. He grabbed their hands and put them there. But he didn't he, have to do Bobby's. Bobby was smart enough to know <laughs> this man was scary enough and he has a bad neck. I will just I take the pose that I know he wants me to do. Right. He leaves, and the announcers are so petrified they still can't move. They're like peeking, but then putting their hands back. For a long time, they just sat there because they were terrified. I believed every word that was coming out of his mouth. <laughs> Groot, I think, may have killed them if the lights had gone off a third time. This is awesome. Disco Inferno versus Saturn. It came out, then went to commercial. We had a cool Sting Hogan promo for Starcade. They came back, the announcers could still barely maintain their composure. Now, I saw a totally different Disco Inferno here than we have seen. He was not cowardly, he had no interest in dancing, he was pissed, he was aggressive, and he was violent. I've been doing this for a while. Don't you remember all those disco Alex Wright matches that you thought would just be ridiculous, but they just had a match? Not like this. No, this was a very serious disco. This was a House of Fire disco. It was still disco. He was all disco inferno. So, they go brawl outside, Saturn gets thrown into the flock, Lodi takes a stunner into the guardrail. Disco throws Saturn back inside and continues this assault. Everything's going fine, and there's about eight seconds of clusterfuckery. Where like, Disco does like a half whip, and Saturn starts running and stops and starts and stops. And he comes back, and neither of them knows what to do. And finally, Saturn says, fuck this! And he starts to throw suplex and throw Disco all over the place. And finally, Disco hits a stunner to win the match and the title out of nowhere. And the flock attacks, but Disco grabs his belt and flees. Nitro Party Clips. You know, in 2016, yes. when I see two guys say they're just too sweet and put their fingers together, I don't think of the NWO, I think of the Young Bucks. Mm -hmm. The Young Bucks would have beat all these guys' asses. Just <laughs> knock the shit out of them. Well, yeah. Buff Bagwell versus Lex Luger. Mike Tanay notes that Luger had actually played with Kelly in what he said was the World Football League, but it was in fact the USFL. Oh, man. Mike Tanay got a fact wrong. Gee, many Christmas. Yes. So the first part of this match with Bagwell doing all his wacky posing and Luger cutting him off and making fun of him was so great. Bagwell has so had so figured out how to be a clowny heel. He would hip toss Luger. Mm -hmm. Luger would take a bump. Mm -hmm. Bagwell would pose. He'd pose. He'd do that run in place dance he had. He'd go to the Go, look into the hard camera on their apron and talk about how great he was. And then Luger would run at him again. Mm -hmm. He did hip toss, wash, rinse, repeat. And finally, Luger's had enough. So Bagwell hits an arm drag or something. And he essentially does the Shawn Michaels kneeling bicep pose. And Lex stands up behind him and flexes his pecs. <laughs> and now you know there's going to be trouble. Lex makes his comeback. Scott Norton comes out. Let's talk about our main man, Nick Patrick. <laughs> Fucking it up just yet again. Get to this. Here's what the finish is on paper. So Luger is outside, and three members of the NWO are going after him, and he's fighting them all off. And as he's fighting them all off, and they're triple teaming him, he gets counted out. Well, he's fighting them, and one guy falls down, and then another guy backs up, and he's just standing there. There's nobody touching him. There's nobody within five feet of him. And Nick Patrick walks over, and he's right above Lex Luger's head, shouting at the top of his lungs what number he's at. And Luger has to pretend like he doesn't notice. And then he goes after Norton, and he gets counted out. I was like, Patrick, you are the fucking worst. This made Luger look like such an idiot. Can't Patrick go back to the NWO again where he was entertaining? <laughs> he's such a bad ref. So yeah, Buff wins. What a geek. The NWO does a video burying Roddy Piper. Had a Sting hype video showing him hiding in the rafters and beating up the NWO. Scott Hall versus DDP. I believe this match went five minutes and four minutes of it was one abdominal stretch spot. This was every Scott Hall DDP match you could imagine. Mm -hmm. So the NWO runs in for the DQ. Now last week... Or maybe two weeks ago on the show I missed, but there was an NWO beatdown when a Sting dummy descended from the ceiling and plunged right through the ring. I'll tell you what else you missed. When that happened, I said on the show, you know what they should have done? Is the dummy should have fallen from the ceiling and gone through the ring, and they hit it with a bat a couple of times, 
But then they go to get it, and it's the real sting. That's what he said. And I was so mad they hadn't done that. But then, you owe WCW an apology. I d- he, that or they stole my idea. Or they stole your idea. And Another timeline. Yeah. So, yes, they're beating up Paige. A sting dummy descends from the ceiling and plunges through the ring again, not to be seen. So the NWO is all having a great laugh. Hogan starts to cut his promo. <laughs> I laughed so hard when he said Sting is such a coward, he's afraid of my triceps. <laughs> Sometimes Hulk Hogan really, really was great. I loved when Hulk Hogan says, what a dummy. And then he howled <laughs> oh, with yeah. laughter. Yes. And then when they want to get the dummy out from under the ring, Hogan is so over the top campy. Like, bring me that dummy, brother. I'm going to lay a beating on it. And you know what's going to happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? But it worked. So three guys go to drag this dummy out of the ring. Even the announcers are like, oh, they're making such a show out of this. Like it takes three of them to drag this dummy out. Never mind the dummy has plunged through the ring. Clearly it has some heft. So they lean the dummy against the ropes and leave it there for a while. Hogan starts to leave and says, you know what? I'm going to beat up the sting dummy. And he goes over. And he yanks off the Sting mask, and it's the real Sting now. And Sting makes his big comeback. He's laying guys out left and right. He's reverse DDT and everyone. Hogan is standing in the ring petrified, and that is how the show ends. Remember when J.J. Dillon couldn't figure out what Sting wanted? Yes. <laughs> this is the stuff that I love about wrestling. You gotta hand it to Hulk Hogan. Like, he was a star for so long because of stuff like this. He was a cartoon character. When he was a babyface, he was an over-the-top hero who also eye-raked and back-raked and cheated a lot. But that's another story entirely. And when he was a heel, he was just so great. I absolutely love that line when he was like, get that dummy out of here. (laughs) It was just awesome. And then he got it. But they have not touched yet. Mm -hmm. No. Well, I think Hogan beat him up a couple of weeks ago, but the big brawl's coming. Yeah. All right, Nitro, then. This show may still be going on as we're talking here. <laughs> Number 118, also December 15th, 1997. By the way, Larry Zabisco is back. Last week, he wasn't there because mm-hmm. he was training for his big match. Yeah. Now it's a week sooner, and he's there. <laughs> yes. He still hasn't had the big match. Well, Craig, you. if you'd ever trained for a big match, you know that sometimes, to avoid overtraining, you've got to back off a little bit. Do you really believe what you're saying right now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's true. Dude, you know how many times Dave has told the story about how before Frank Shamrock had his match with Tito Ortiz, one day, like a week and a half before, they went to the beach for three days, and Dave couldn't figure out why, and Frank told him, I was close to overtraining. I gotta back off for a few days. They went to the beach. But Larry came to work. Larry here (laughs) is Frank Shamrock. Wow. I'll get to that later. Okay. I got more. I can't wait. The announcers ran down the show for several minutes, and the NWO came out for a promo. The whole NWO. 85 minutes. Well, minus Masa Kevin Nash. Chono was there. He identified Masahiro Chono, said, Masahiro Chono, why don't you cut a promo in Japanese? And you cut a promo in Japanese. And they say, way to go, Masahiro Chono. <laughs> <laughs> this was clearly a three-hour show. Kurt Hennig cuts a promo on Ric Flair. <laughs> Three hours, what should we do? And John- Some <laughs> Chono speak. And just because they're in short. He doesn't speak English. I don't care. Yeah. Talk anyway. He vowed to retire Flair at Starcade. Hogan ran down Sting for a while, dared him to come fight tonight, and that was that. This accomplished nothing. Oh, yeah. You know what's weird about it, too? Is Hogan's promo, challenging Sting, was such an absolutely nothing promo. Yes. And they still did, like, their most buys ever. <laughs> they had to kill time. So Hogan cut a promo at the end. And it was nothing. No, we'll talk about killing time here in a little while. Okay. The NWO did a hype video running down Larry Zabisco. And they ran a second completely separate hype video running down the Steiners. They recapped Flair running Brett, running down Bret Hart last week. At this point, I asked, is there any wrestling on the show? Boy, did I learn my lesson. <laughs> yeah, don't do that Don't again. ever ask for any wrestling on the show. Because I got Vincent versus Ray Trailer. Hey, listen. Whatever I said about Hawk... <laughs> I apologize. 
He was better than Vincent. And see, the thing was, I watched Nitro first this week. I normally watch Nitro second, but because it's three hours, I got to watch it first now. So I had not watched Hawk yet. But had I watched Hawk first, boy, oh boy, Vincent is the worst wrestler. Like, it's got to be the worst wrestler ever. He's way up there. Not only was he horrible, but like, he couldn't even go up for anything. No. Let me tell you, let me tell you why I'm sure he's the worst wrestler of all time. He did a jumping axe handle, Mm -hmm. a double sledge. That's right. Let me explain this, everybody. You jump in the air with your hands clasped together. You strike a man. That's it. Am I missing anything? (laughs) No. No. You have gotten all details. This fucking guy, there's a point to jumping. You jump Uh so that when you land, there's a... And that's the moment where your hands hit the guy's back. Correct. This motherfucker jumps in the air, and on the way down, he hits Ray Trailer <laughs> before his feet make contact. Stiffest fucking double sled you've ever seen. And he knocks himself off balance by hitting the guy before his feet hit the ground. He can't go up for anything. He couldn't go up for a body slam. He couldn't go up for... The fucking Bray trailer, the trailer park slam, they're calling it. Trailer trash. Dead weighted him on every single move. And of course, you dead weight Ray trailer. Ray trailer just slams you on your ass as hard as he can. He doesn't care. This was like the worst. This was worse than any Bariquas match. This was worse than any match on Nitro. This was worse than any match in TNA, with the exception of the Survivor Chick. This was worse than any match I've seen this year. This was atrocious beyond description. All this in one minute and 51 seconds. We spent way more time talking about this match than it actually happened, but we were also way more entertaining than this match. We had a giant Kevin Nash video package, at which point Tony Schiavone, who got into this calling a legit sport in baseball, said with a straight face, these are the two biggest men in the history of the sport. Yeah. Liar. You are a liar. Yuji Nagata versus Disco Inferno. Listen, I hope you guys saw on the board that I was right about Disco Inferno. He has been a serious wrestler more often than not. I noticed it in this match, Brian. And he was again here. He had a serious match. Even though he had shake your booty on his ass, he had a serious match with Yuji Nagata and beat him. What I love is he's been doing the stunner for a while now. So he hits Sonny Ono with a stunner first. Then when it's time to finish off Yuji, first he sets him up with the uh, stun gun. <laughs> yeah. Which is stunning Steve Austin's finisher. Then he has the stunner and wins. I imagine the Fez Press and the Million Dollar Dream are coming. He is now 2-0 and in his title reign. There was one <laughs> something or other. Right before the finish, Disco wants to give him an Irish whip. Yuji Nagata does not want to be rip- whipped into the ropes. And he grabs the ropes and he holds on for dear life. And there's a long struggle. And then finally, Disco wins. I don't know what happened. How about the capo kick that Nagata hit on Disco? Yeah. This is a great match. Ow. He killed him with it. You know what was a great match? Really? I was disappointed. Fit Finley and Dean Malenko? Yeah. Oh. I mean, it was good. I but am- I saw these two men get in the ring and I, I just sat back and I... Crack my knuckles, got some popcorn. I have never said this before in my life, what I'm about to say, but I mean this. Everyone needs to go to the network, queue up this match, just to watch, just to see these men do snapmares. They were so awesome. You can have your super kicks in your 450s. Just show me two guys doing wrestling that looks real. I'm excited. Eddie Guerrero was on commentary, running down Dean, says it's very boring to travel with him. Third week in a row he's been on commentary during Dean matches? Something like that, yes. Three or four. He begins to make his way down to ringside. Dean spies him coming in, but this distracts him, and Finley drops him from behind and hits a tombstone for the win. It was pretty good. I liked it a lot. It was not nearly as good as the next match. This match was fun. The NWO did a video ring down Roddy Piper, and then La Parca and Psychosis versus Rey Mysterio and Juventud Guerrera. You know what's so awesome about this match? They did an old school 
Southern style exactly. professional wrestling <laughs> This match. is four luchadors. With crazy lucha moves. This is four luchadors doing an impression of a U.S. style tag match. It was great. A lot of the time was clunky. A lot of the time was great. The coolest thing they did. One of the coolest things I've ever seen. Hooventude's finisher is the Hoovy driver. It's a Michinoku driver. Psychosis says, I'm going to one-up this fucker. I'm going to hit him with his own move, and we're going to do it from the top rope. So he takes him up there. He's standing on the top rope with Hoovy in body slam position. And he jumps, and in midair, Hoovy rotates both of them, so they land with Hoovy hitting the Michinoku driver. That was so awesome. Psychosis is a huge man compared to Hoovy. Yes. And 10 seconds later, he was on his feet on offense again. It's true. Well, that annoyed happen. me. I just loved it was Hoovy making a hot tag. Ray makes an old school baby face comeback. The heels are bumbling idiots. They yes. run into each other. Big baby face dives to the outside. And finally, Ray does a springboard Hurricane Rana on Parka outside, which was crazy. Mm-hmm. Yep. And Hoovy hits a 450 in the ring on Sakosis for the pin. If they would have done this match like at house shows for oh, two months, yeah, yeah, they would have showed up on pay per view and had the best match in history. True, that's a good point. Yeah, it was it was funny because during the heat portion of this imitation of a tag match, like I say, it was really really clunky and really flat. But that just set up Ray and Hoovy running wild with every acrobatic move you've ever seen, and the crowd went ballistic. I loved this match. Even Hoovy did look good in this match. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> He was a great Ricky. You know Martin. what? In yeah. this match, he may have been the best guy. In in this match, okay. For this eight I minutes, I'd go that far. Went. I I thought Ray was spectacular. Yeah. Dude, Ray was awesome. La Parca was awesome. I was so mad La Parca was being La Parca, and they kept missing it on camera. <laughs> yeah. You could just hear him being La Parca in the background. Gene Oakland is in the ring with Doug Dillinger and some uh, police dignitaries. I will let you talk about what everybody said, but I just want you all, as you listen to this, to realize that what happened was Ric Flair was very calm and quiet and dignified Mm -hmm. when the policemen were there. Right. And as soon as they left, he went nuts. All bets were off. That is a fact. That is a fact. So Flair and Arn are out there, and it's in Charlotte. And Flair, I don't want... You know when they say be yourself with the volume turned up to 11? I don't want to say he had the volume turned down, but it was like a eight and a half he yeah. was still very loud and charismatic but he was also sane the authorities were there if he didn't want to get in trouble so the thing that all this was the city of charlotte had erected a tribute to slain police officers and on behalf of wcw flair was there to present them with a check for fifteen thousand dollars so this is all very nice and they said thank you we're all honored to have you here in charlotte and uh they they go to leave and flair like watches them go <laughs> yeah he he's makes, like are they far enough away he makes sure that he's safe <laughs> and he goes just crazy flair for a minute and I, I don't even know what he said but it was awesome <laughs> I know what he said he vowed that the NWO would not beat him up in Charlotte tonight and I thought you uh, damn fool yeah hmm. Oakland interviewed J.J. Dillon this was so dumb yeah. This should have been on Raw. <laughs> <laughs> Bischoff immediately interrupted. Says, I never claimed to be a wrestler, but Larry Zabisco, not only is he a wrestler, he's a former world champion. He outweighs me by 60 pounds. I can't wrestle this man. I will only go into this fight if punches, <laughs> kicks, and knockouts count. Yeah. Like in a regular match. Like in every other match that has ever been held in the history of WCW Monday Nitro. Well, I will say, to be fair, you're not supposed to punch people in a wrestling match. I'll give you that. But kicks and knockouts? Yeah, I've seen punches in every match I've ever seen, pretty much. I've seen kicks in pretty much every match I've ever seen. Now, I will say, I've never seen a man formally win by knockout. And Larry did add he wanted to clear kicks to the head are legal whether your opponent is grounded or not. Well, technically... UFC? I think technically, when Stone Cold gives you a stunner, you're knocked out. Sure. He just makes sure to pin you first. Yes. He could just stand there and get a standing 10 count. I see. He's paid by the hour, apparently. Yeah. So anyway, JG agreed with all these rules, and Bischoff was pleased. The best part is, Larry's on commentary. He's also pleased. Well, now I can punch him. There's more. So JJ says, Eric, I know you have a martial arts background. 
and Larry has a wrestling background. Which at that point, I howled that they're not acknowledging Larry Zbysko's martial arts experience that he talks about on every fucking show. So JJ says, as long as you agree that submissions are allowed in this wrestling match, I'll go along with your rules. So they all agreed, and those are the rules. It's a wrestling match where (laughs) submissions, knockouts, (laughs) kicks, and punches are legal. They count. Unlike everything else at Starcade, apparently. Was this part of your killing time argument? No, but the second time these fuckers came out, I was fixing to get mad, and then Brett showed up. Scott Hall came out for a promo. He did a survey. They were in Flair Country, so the people were, in fact, there to see WCW. Hall pretended the cheers were so loud they hurt his ears. He claimed the NWO won anyway. That was it. They went to commercial. Chris Jericho versus Scott Hall. I had forgotten how often Scott Hall used choke slams in WCW. I know he's making fun of the giant, but it was still awesome. Good choke slam. He choke slammed the hell out of Jericho. Did that weird pose where he makes fun of the giant for being tall. That's called the baby learning to walk pose. Sure. I thought he was doing the Frankenstein walk. Yeah. Well, if you think about it's it, all Frank- the same thing. Frankenstein was a baby when he learned to walk. Just a. <laughs> That's how babies walk. Yeah. They baby. put their arms out like this, and they kind of waddle back and forth like a mummy. Frankenstein was never a baby. Vincent. No, but he was. A, he, well, he, no, was. he was. He was. He was, he was a grown was a, baby. He was two days old. He was a baby composed of the Frankenstein's oh, monster. Thank you. I was not going to oh, bring geez. that up. I was what he did last time. I gotcha. He's right. It was Frankenstein's monster. Dork alert. Victor Frankenstein was the doctor who put the monster together. I'm just amazed I got him this time. Yeah. Usually he has to get me. It's true. Really, it was just the one time. Yeah, but it's the most recent. This is going to be years a, ago. <laughs> this little interaction is going to make a great song one day. Anyway, uh, Hall had a choke slam in the Outsiders' Edge for the win. Then I got mad. Did you? Yeah. The Nitro Party? No. Oh. Mongo. We'll yeah. get to Mongo. There was a Nitro Party clips, and I mentioned this because all these other Nitro Parties have been so goddamn lame. Mm-hmm. This one looked like fun. They rented like a college classroom, so they had the big screen TV up front and arena seating. Everyone could sit there and cheer, and they had, uh, they had legit dancing girls there. This looked like a cool party. Mm-hmm. I sent that video in. <laughs> NWA, you never went to college. NWA had an anti I rented a video. room at Shoreline <laughs> in the karate wing. <laughs> All right, we got Ming versus Mongo. Brian, the floor is yours. Oh, we didn't get Ming versus Mongo. Oh. We were supposed to get Ming versus Mongo, but... Goldberg bastard. killed Mongo. <laughs> and so JJ is furious, much like I was. I wanted to see Ming versus Mongo. And so then JJ says, Goldberg, you killed Mongo. Therefore, you must face Ming. And I was like, finally, this fucker made a good ruling. <laughs> so Goldberg doesn't give a shit. He's like, I'll go kill this guy. And Goldberg starts going down to the ring. And before he can get there, Mongo is alive again. Like Frankenstein's monster. And he lurches down the aisle. He attacks Goldberg. A bunch of geeks wearing WCW security jean jackets come out and break this up. Nothing says authority like denim. And we never got to see Ming versus Goldberg. Damn it. That was two Ming matches I really wanted to see, and I got neither of them. I'm sure it's coming down the road. Like, J.J. couldn't find a third geek to go face Ming? Come on. It's three hours. Conan and Scott Norton versus the Steiners. Oh, my. Well, we knew it was coming. <laughs> this is a car wreck. <laughs> Scott Steiner was massive. I Just hope that's not what you got out of this match. No, not by the end. So, he's press slamming dudes and suplexing them over the, all over the place. And then Scott Norton's in there with Rick, and uh, he goes for a power slam that went as wrong as a power slam ever could. This is the one, because I was watching this Sunday night, it was at your house, and you and Winnie are having a conversation, I'm over on the couch minding my own business, and out of nowhere, I just shrieked. That was right here when Rick Steiner died. Now, some of you are saying, Vince, Rick is alive. No, Rick's dead. (laughs) It was really weird because it was almost like, it was almost like, Rick went thinking he was going to get power slammed. And Scott Norton went in thinking, I'm going to take a crossbody. Mm. Now, why Rick Steiner would do a crossbody is anybody's guess. But basically, Scott Norton just fell on his back, and then Rick spiked himself onto his own head. 
trying to turn himself over for a power slam that didn't exist. And the craziest thing about it was, if this happened to anybody else in any other match, number one, they would be dead. And number two, if they weren't dead, they would go tag out. Right. (laughs) Not Rick Steiner. Rick Steiner shook his head back and forth to make sure that his head was still attached, and he just kept going. He just stayed in the ring. Have you seen the um, the video footage of Hideo Itami getting power slammed on his head? It wasn't quite that bad, but it was pretty close. I don't know. This may have been worse. Well, Steiner is also twice Itami's size. Exactly. That's more weight to fall on your neck. Luckily, but also he has a stronger no neck. neck. So he died here. His corpse no sold everything. And his zombie began to run around the ring, hitting dives of all things. And eventually, Norton killed him with the shoulder breaker. There was a four-way, and then after all this, Vincent just interferes with the DQ. Because God forbid that Scott Norton and Conan lose a match. Here's what I couldn't figure out. Vincent runs in for the DQ, and Ray Trailer makes the save. Yeah. Well, he beat him earlier. Shouldn't have been the other way around. Like, you do this match, and then later in the show, you yes. do Ray Trailer versus Vincent. Absolutely. Did well, they, I like, think- put the thing together and just go, Ah, oh, no. Ray Trailer and Vincent should be the opener. That's I a ass- hot match. I assume it's all going to be a six-man. So oh, I can't S- wait for that. Scott Norton, Conan, and Vincent versus Ray Trailer, Scott Steiner, and Rick Steiner's ghost. That's Rick Steiner's dead. You know what else? Horrible. You know what else was notable? When Scott Norton killed Rick Steiner, neither Steiner went to get a receipt on Scott Norton. Well, ah, just the cost of doing business. Well, so, why would you? Well, I think it must have been either Rick fucked up or the Steiners had just so much great respect for Scott Norton that it was like, eh. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> Shit happens. It happens. When you're big and strong, sometimes you drop someone on their head. <laughs> That's the worst fortune cookie I've ever heard. I mean, can you imagine if Vincent would have dropped Rick Steiner on his neck? The, uh, <laughs> he would not be at conferences right they'd now. They drawn and quartered him <laughs> in the ring. Goddamn wrestling superstar Virgil. <laughs> And just grabbed his ankles and grabbed his wrist and just yanked them all off. Then they replayed the power slam like three uh, times. At least they got the most out of it. Booker T versus Randy Savage. We had Booker running wild for a while. Savage cut him off, threw him into furniture, and vice versa, threw furniture into him. A fan tried to hit the ring here, was immediately taken out by security. I was bummed because Savage threw some kicks at him and never really landed a good shot. Well, let's think about this very quickly first off (laughs) this fan idiot was so angry about a competitive match between randy savage and booker t that he decided he needed to hit the ring Mm -hmm. and then the other thing to think about is he thought it was a good idea to hit the ring with randy savage thank you yeah well this is why i was so disappointed yeah i thought randy might have killed this guy like norton killed rick what a first-class moron. Yeah. Alcohol is a powerful thing. <laughs> this Did you notice there was another fan hitting the ring later in the show? There two. Were two later. Yeah. yeah. Actually, three, because the, there was one. It was off camera, but you could see security subduing a man after the pair hit. Yes. So, coincidence or not, after this fan hit the ring, we immediately got our finish. The ref got bumped in a bad-looking spot. Booker went up top. Liz grabbed him. Savage knocked him to the floor, waffled him with a plastic chair, threw him in, and hit the elbow for the win. Chris Benoit versus Scotty Riggs. Fourth week in a row that was supposed to be Benoit versus Raven, and Raven sent in a flunky instead. Raven's still sick, Brian? It's been a month. Well, he was sick last week. Maybe they just thought it was a good storyline. So this is not a total squash like most of these have been. They went back and forth the whole way. And Benoit won with a cross face out of nowhere. It was a glorious beating. Yeah, that, that, that is true. Every week. That is right. This was more back and forth than most Benoit flock matches, but Scotty still took a hellacious beating. So Benoit wins the cross face out of nowhere, starts to cut a promo on the flock, goes after them. Even without Raven, there's still six dudes there, and they overwhelmed him and laid him out. Okay. They've been doing such a good job in this feud getting Benoit over for Raven. But boy, did they make him look like an absolute idiot here when he destroys the guy and then voluntarily jumps over the rail into the flock and they beat his ass. It's like, could you be dumber? Notice that Scotty Riggs uh, has been wearing an eye patch because of the 
whole incident with the chair and Raven. Yes. And not only does he wear the eye patch, but he puts one of these contacts in as well. Yes, the eye patch gets ripped off. We see his yeah we, contact eye. Completely white eye. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, don't mess around with chairs, Craig. Duly noted. Now listen, I'm not a music guy. No. I'm I'm not. Huh. Right Did Billy time. Idol have a gimmick where he carried signs around? No. What the hell is with Idol and his damn signs? Because they were watching ECW, mm-hmm. and of all the things to steal, they said, we need a guy with signs. And they gave it to Lodi? Yeah. You know, I found, <laughs> yes. Lodi's, I found Lodi's Facebook the other day. Ah. He looks exactly like... Billy Idol? No, oh. he doesn't look like Billy Idol anymore. He looks like Scott Dawson. Hmm. Shaved head. Bald and that mustache gimmick. Really? Yeah. Oh, there you go. I just like that. Now he can be Tox. <laughs> Scott spelled backwards. Ah, I see. It's a new gimmick. I just like that ECW had a guy with signs because they were struggling to make money just to stay alive every show. They said, let's go to the drugstore and get some poster boards and a Sharpie and make signs. Mm hmm. WCW is owned by Turner Broadcasting. Right. They did the same thing. They could have had like an LED sign. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You could have come out with different six TVs. Each TV would have a different sign on it. They're supposed to be the flock, geek. Yeah, a bunch still. of down and out numbskulls under Raven's control. How did they have money for poster board? Hey, Raven's out there going, I got this idea, Lodi. We're going to get a neon flashing sign. You know, what has, occur- up. You know what has occurred to me without this conversation? None of this really makes any sense. Of course no. not. When you bring it down. It goes back to my first question. Why is a fake Billy Idol running around with signs? I don't have an answer. I look at all these gimmicks and I'm like, why? <laughs> who? What? Who's Steve Stevenson in this equation? I don't know who Steve Stevenson is. He's a guitar player for Billy Idol. I still don't know who Steve Stevenson is. So J.J. Dillon comes back out to continue the same damn angle they did an hour earlier. Yeah. Because the show's three hours long. And this time... It's all about who is going to referee their match at Starcade. Eric Bischoff does not want a fat ref. No. Because he's too damn fast. He wants Kevin Nash. I don't want a fat ref. He says, I want a tall ref. Yeah. You can I w- see everything. I want a guy, I want a guy who's really <laughs> tall. And no, really mobile. He doesn't want a fat guy because a fat guy's too slow. Right. But he wants Kevin Nash who's had 16 knee surgeries yes. so far. And he, he can't, can't even get down and yeah, up off the bend. mat. So finally, JJ says, I'll pick an NWO guy. And Bischoff is all excited. And so, this actually made sense. It's Bret Hart! This was Bret Hart's debut, because Eric Bischoff has claimed Mm -hmm. that Bret Hart is a member of the NWO. Mm -hmm. So Bret Hart comes out, WCW debut. Bischoff's very happy to see him. He is much happier, in fact, than Bret Hart, who looked very uncomfortable throughout this entire segment. I noticed that as well. Just first day at a new job, it's always a little weird. Says, it's great to be in Ric Flair country. I will be honored to be the referee for this match. Bischoff jumps in. He's bragging about signing Brett, how great they're going to be together. But sure to point out several times throughout the segment that Brett's making seven and a half million dollars of Ted Turner's money. And he stops and jumps away and he's pumping his fists and dancing. And Brett just says, barely into the mic, he's very happy. (laughs) So he warns Bischoff. Do what you can, win if you can, but don't look to me for help. Nobody knows better than me what it's like to be screwed by a ref. So you're on your own, Jack. Bishop says, Brett, seven and a half million dollars, weekends off. And everyone looks at each other for a while. <laughs> then it ends. You know, I was so sad when I watched this because you could already see what the finish was for Hogan and Sting at Starcade. Right. And it was really a great finish. It sure would have been. Sting, well, there was a bigger problem in the sense that Sting should have come in and just obliterated Hulk Hogan for like 10 straight minutes. Yeah. And finally, there would be like 9 million run-ins and something would happen and Sting would get screwed yeah. with a, a super fast count. Yeah. And then Bret Hart comes out and says, God damn it, there's not going to be a screw job here. I'm restarting this match. Not only was there not a fast count, but Hulk Hogan beat up Sting for 10 minutes before he pinned him. Uh-huh. 
And it's so painful to me because it would have been so awesome. Yes. If they would have just done what they were building up to do in storyline. Blows my mind. NWO video running down Lex Luger. Gene then brings Luger out for a promo, but instead is Buff Bagwell. So Buff does this promo. He is interviewing or I- imitating Lex Luger's voice, which is hard to do because it's not like there's any great distinctive tone to Lex's voice, but I can mm-hmm. tell he was trying. And Lex comes out to put a stop to this. Buff does not back down and says, Lex, you can't beat me. And Lex says, Buff, you've been celebrating your count out in DQ wins. I'm challenging you, challenging you to a match tonight. And Buff says, you don't have a ref. And Lex says, I've got Nick's Pat- Nick Patrick. Buff says, well, I'm not warmed up. And Lex says, let's see if I can warm you up and slaps him across the face. And now Buff's warmed up and ready to go. This was a lot of fun. Not only that, but Luger was so over. Again. Yes. yes. Yeah. It's been years. Every time this guy comes out, he's the most over guy on the show. It just blows my mind. So they had a two-minute match. Then there was interference. Lex clotheslines Buff over the top, which is a DQ, so Buff wins again. This was terribly, terribly, terribly lame, but at least you can see it's leading to something. They haven't done Dude, it's the December the 97, and we have an over-the-top rope DQ. They haven't done one ever, I don't think, on Nitro. Since we've been watching it, I don't think they ever did an over-the-top disqualification. And just for no reason, no, they did one here. They've, they've had a guy go over the top rope and then talked about the referee's discretion as they try to cover up for the fact that they've forgotten that that's okay. a rule. But now all of a sudden they decided it was a rule again. Exactly. This is bullshit. <laughs> exactly. Had an NWO video burying DDP. Kurt Hennig came out for a promo. At this point I realized I have heard the NWO theme song no less than 500 times on this show. <laughs> he addresses... <laughs> Kurt's in the ring. I forgot about this until right now. He's got his mic. He's got his belt. And he's cutting this promo saying, nothing. This is Ric Flair country. I am the U.S. champ. I'll take on any challenger in the crowd. And then we'll go all night and go a little longer. And he starts ripping off Flair's catchphrases. And I realize he is looking directly, making eye contact with somebody at ringside. And this somebody's job it is to tell him, okay, we've killed enough time. You can shut up now. Until then, he's just got to go. And so he just goes on and on saying, Nothing. He has so much time to fill here. You know what's weird about this was, <laughs> first off, this was a great example of, we don't need three hours here. No. We need two. He's rambling, and 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 Flair finally comes out, and the match goes 10 seconds. I, I, I timed it. 17. 17. Bell to bell. And at first I thought, you know, as much as it was bullshit for the guy to ramble for so long and kill so much time... I mean, they are supposed to be wrestling at Starcade, so I guess it's kind of good that he rambled and we didn't get anything resembling a match. Now it makes you want to pay to see them have a match. But as it turns out, the reason they went 17 seconds was Flair's got a bad ankle. And not only does he have a bad ankle, at this point, they're not even sure he's going to be ready for Starcade. And they're still building up a match between Kurt Hennick and Ric Flair for Starcade that may not even happen. That's why they had to carry him out afterwards. So, there was eight guys out there fighting, beating up Ric Flair. And DDP and the Steiners and Luger come out to make the save. And they carry him to the back. DDP gets a promo calling out Hennig. We get the NWO music again. Two more fans at the ring. One of them gets yanked out by the ring announcer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the other got... Uh, tackled essentially by Randy Anderson. Randy Anderson, the guy was going to escape, and Randy Anderson pulled him back into the ring and put a chokehold on him. Yeah. It was awesome. My favorite thing in wrestling, I think, ever is wrestlers and referees and announce- and ring announcers beating up fans. Absolutely. What I love about it is sometimes a fan hits the ring and the wrestler will just kind of be confused and <laughs> sort of just look at him while security takes him away. And then sometimes you'll get the wrestler who really wants to put the boots to him. Mm-hmm. That was Conan here. Yeah, sure, It took a sure. long time for Conan to see that there was a guy in the ring. Like, the guy's being carted away, and I don't know what Conan's doing. But all of a sudden, Conan turns and he sees the guy. Yeah. 
and you just see him. He like gets Meat. so excited and he starts moving right at the guy, yeah. but the guy is being taken away. Like a dog with a stake. Oh man, he wanted to put the boots to this guy. There was a few months back an NWO segment where a fan hit the ring and Randy Savage was there and Kevin Nash, I believe, saved this man's life <laughs> by putting an arm on Savage's shoulder and said, stay here. They've got him. You'll go to jail. It's not worth it. Now, Amidst all this, this all started with a long Kurt Hennig promo, a 17-second match, a brawl, and this Hen- and, and this Page promo. Now Hulk Hogan comes back out, at which point Tony Schiavone said the exact words, which I am not making up. This has become a real draining three hours. <laughs> Dude, this show. Page flees through the crowd. I'm thinking, what in the hell are they going to do? I look down at the little thing. There's still four minutes of TV time to go. What can possibly happen? Hogan runs his mouth for a while. Call Sting a coward. Lights go out. There's a spotlight on Sting on the rafters. Spotlight goes out. House lights come up. And now security is going after more fans. Lights go out again. Come back up again. Sting is on top of the logo on the stage. Hogan calls him a coward. And as the thing ends. Sting has descended from the stage. Or the, the logo. He is walking down the ramp. And the show just ends. Mercifully. Oh my God. I don't that wanna, last hour. I don't want to be I may a never be the same. broken record here, but this show was exactly like a modern day Raw. Too long. I don't know Michael Cole. Too much filler. No Kevin Dunn. Would have been way better at two hours. Nobody ever learns a goddamn thing in this business. WCW was three hours for three years. And they went from the top of the world to out of business. In that period of time. Nobody thought about that when they moved Raw to three hours. And granted, Raw has done a better job with three hours than Nitro did. Because they've lasted four years without going out of business. But oh my god, a wrestling show does not need to be three hours long. Vinny, you watch football. Sure do. Okay. I'm not a sports guy, but I know Vinny will back me up here. So I know that people are going to say, Brian... UFC shows can be six hours long. And football games every Sunday are like three hours long, right? Three hours long? On average, college is close to four. Okay, four hours. So, correct me if I'm wrong. There's four quarters. Mm -hmm. Okay. Each quarter is 15 minutes. Of, uh, yeah, sure. Right? Yeah. That's on the clock. Yes. Okay, that's 60 minutes. Mm -hmm. Somehow this gets stretched over three to four hours, right? Yes. There's half an hour of halftime. Because there's halftime... The clock stops, people get in position, they film the guy who's throwing his papers down or whatever. Like, there's a lot of downtime in a three-hour football game. Absolutely. Right? Yes. Or any sport. Yes. You watch a UFC, there's there's nine million video packages, there's the ring introductions, there's commercials. Mm -hmm. These fucking wrestling shows, especially... It's one thing during the Monday Night Wars, but today when there's no competition, Raw is just segment after segment after segment after segment after segment. There's no downtime. This three hours of Raw is not like three hours of a football game. It's not like three hours of a basketball game or a baseball game. Yeah. It's three hours of nonstop stuff. It's a killer. It also helps that in the end, there's going to be a victor. One team's going to be beaten, yes. and the other team's going to win. Those three hours, they are leading to something. But yeah, but uh, yes, it would be different if the matches on a three-hour show, if they were going, and they were good matches, 15 or 20 minutes. Because you'd have, in a long match like that, you'll have time to breathe. It's not two-minute entrance, two-minute entrance, three-minute match, two-minute promo, gone. It's not four different things crammed into one segment. No. It's just just do one match. There's time to crack open a beer and talk to your buddies and go make something to eat. You can't do that with these three-hour wrestling shows. If you, for example, are watching any sporting event, and it's the second quarter, and you say, hey, you know what? I got a big load of laundry to fold. Yep. And you start going through your laundry, and uh, it takes a half hour, and you kind of half watch the game out of the corner of your eye. They'll recap you on everything that's going on. You won't feel like you've... You miss nine things if you leave Raw for 15 minutes. Yes. Anyway, that's enough ranting. We are at the sooner we get started on Nitro, the sooner we'll be done talking about Nitro. Everyone ready? I guess so. Should we do some meditation first? Make sure we enter this with clear minds. Can we just get going? Deep cleansing for fuck's breath. sake. Nitro number 119, December 22nd, 1997. What a horrible show. 
You know how horrible the show was? Go home show for Starcade. It was bad. It was a very... But you know what it proves? It proves when you got a great main event, you can have a terrible go home show. Everyone's still going to buy the stupid pay per view. So they run down Starcade for a while. We have a hype video with Eric Bischoff running down Larry Zabisco and talking about how dangerous his feet and fists were. Hey, good promo. It went forever, but it was good and it had a point. Good thing he took those two weeks off two weeks ago to train. Yeah. Yeah, Larry missed one show in training. Two weeks ago. Yeah. Fit Finley versus Eddie Guerrero. This was way better till the end. Yes, they were having a very fun back and forth match. No, the Finlay Malenko that you liked so much last week. Oh, I see. This was better. Yeah. Except oh, yeah. for the ending. Having a very fun back and forth match. And then five minutes in, Eddie says, I'm done, and he leaves and he gets counted out, and that's it. Why did they even bother? Oh well, hell, because Vinny. They have three hours, just like they do every Monday. There was no one on this roster Eddie could have pinned going into his pay-per-view match? Mm, apparently not. Did you notice the extra security around ringside? Yeah. This- <laughs> three men ran in last week, at least. Yeah. Should so- add, by the way, that there was a superplex in this match. If you have not watched the show yet, keep an eye out for the superplex that Fit Finley does on Eddie Guerrero. If you've ever wanted to know, what would it look like? To see a shoot superplex. <laughs> it happened in this match. <laughs> Eddie did not jump at all. He fucking grabbed him and lift him up and suplexed his ass into the ring. It was awesome. It's crazy when you see something as simple as a superplex. And in 1997, watch the crowd lose their mind over a move like that. Yeah. When you protect moves like that and they're not done in every match, that's a big deal. So I'm not sure what the deal was. Or I'm, sure, I'm not sure what the deal was with a lot of things in this show. But at random, they were just showing all the football players and basketball players who had been on WCW shows all year. So we got a clip of Kevin Green. There you go. Had a giant Kevin Nash video package, which was the giant sitting down in a chair. And uh, he was basically doing his impression of Liam Neeson's speech on the phone from Taken, where he's sitting and uh, intently speaking about the threats he's going to carry out on this opponent. He insists Kevin Nash is not seven feet tall and thus not a real giant. He's promising pain like Nash has (laughs) never felt before. Well, it's funny because Nash himself has admitted he's 6'10 on this fucking show doing commentary. Yes. And then WCW announces he's 7'2". Yes. And then the big show says he's not even seven feet tall. Yes. And he's right. And Nash never said he was. No. Show's a disaster. (laughs) Till the next match. (laughs) Mongo Ming. I loved it. This was the greatest match I've ever seen this week. <laughs> Let me just talk about the finish. The rest doesn't matter. This is what they actually did. Yes. They're having this match, and the referee's distracted, and Mongo grabs one of those big wooden chairs. And he swings this big wooden chair, and he smashes it over Meng's head, and the chair is dangling around Meng's neck like, like a necklace of bones. And Ming responds by firing up. And Mongo's like, shit. Here's a steel chair. And he grabs a steel chair. And he lifts it high over his head and he smashes Ming in the head with his steel chair. And Ming just looks at him. And he fires up. And Mongo's like, shit. So he grabs him and tombstones him and pins him. <laughs> That's a fucking match. Yep, I'm not making yep. this up. Yep. That's what they decided to the do. The only thing you're skipping over, which makes it even better, is that in between hitting him with the steel chair and hitting his tombstone, Mongo paused to remove the wooden chair from Ming's head. <laughs> yeah. Later, Ming, let me help you. It was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know what to say. We see so many pattern finishes nowadays. This is not pattern. I just loved this. I loved every bit of this. I'm going to hit you in the head. That doesn't work. I'm going to hit you in the head again. That doesn't work. All right. I'm going to hit you on the head with the earth. <laughs> and it worked. It's so wacky because Ming's a house of fire. But he's not doing anything. He's just roaring a lot. And he lets Mongo grab him and drop him on his head. Ming has got to be his own agent for matches. There's no way they tell him what to do. So th- I, I need to talk about this more. <laughs> There's times in the... It was a short, intense, sloppy brawl, this match. It was fun in a sloppy way. Mongo, at times, has appeared to be his very first match. <laughs> I don't even know what to say about the frog splash Mang did here. <laughs> Except, man, that's a big frog. And then we got the chairs and the tombstone and the win. Once again, 
If you want to know why Nitro is beating Raw, it's because on Raw, I had to see DOA and 8 Ball, all these fucking teams, and on Nitro, I could watch Mang and Mongo. Yes. They showed clips of Reggie White in the match he had against Mongo on a pay-per-view. I have never seen this match. I did not see it back then. I have not seen it back in the day. But there was a three-second clip here of Reggie White wrestling. The worst. <laughs> the worst I've ever seen. Worse than Kirk and an 8 Ball. And think about this. They had that whole match to choose clips from. That's the best they could find. <laughs> yeah. I need to hunt this down now. Well, this was WCW. It's possible they weren't looking for the best. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that clip sucks. Oh, whatever. <laughs> That's entirely possible. Fans won't notice he's no good. Yeah. DDP came out for a promo. He talks about Ric Flair for a while. He goes off on a spiel about how he likes Christmas. And eventually says the chance to beat Kurt Hennig for the U.S. title was his Christmas present this year. What's good? Basic Enzo Amore go home promo. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. We had a giant Nash tail of the tape, and here again they claimed Nash was seven foot one. These idiots. <laughs> He's growing and shrinking throughout the show. Laparca and Psychosis and Silver King versus Hector Garza and Juventud Guerrera and Rey Mysterio Jr. Now before you talk about the match, the announcers are talking to Larry. Because Larry is gonna face Eric this Sunday to determine whether or not. It's going to remain Monday Nitro, or if it will be NWO Nitro. And they note, <laughs> without a hint of irony, Larry, we're really happy you're here working when you should be training. <laughs> <laughs> so Larry says, I have forgotten more about wrestling than the entire NWO knows about wrestling, and Bischoff is going to take the blunt of it. The blunt. I missed that. Yeah. Gonna... Explain a lot here. So, guys, we're here in this Lucha match. We're... Oh, first of all, very early on, Hoovy tried a springboard reverse Rana and about broke his head off. Why would you do a reverse Hurricane Rana or try because it failed miserably if that's the finish? Because it's Hoovy. Well, that answered that. Yeah. So... Guys are flying around, and it's fun, but the fans aren't really into it. And then finally, Ray enters, and everyone goes nuts because Ray's a superstar. And there is a dive spot that ends with Hector hitting his corkscrew plancha onto the floor onto everyone. And shortly thereafter, Ray hit a top rope reverse Rana on Silver King for the win. That was a good match. That was the best match on this night, for sure. It was a very, very fun little match. And Ray, no one in the Cruiserweight division today sticks out like Ray sticks out. No. Like, he stuck out amongst all of these great workers. Yes. Like, there were all these great luchadors, and, like, La Parca got to do some La Parca stuff, and everybody was awesome. Even Hoovy had some awesome spots in between fucking everything up. And then there's Ray, just, like, a step above everybody else. I think it was cool, too, because last week they had that lucha tag match, and so, hey, that was really good. It worked. Let's do it again and add more guys. Cool. It's perfect. Yeah. This is actually a key point because in 2016, if you took two teams out there and put them together and they had a good match, they would just say, we'll do the exact same shit next week. That's true. Here, they at least added guys. It's a little different. Clips of a Nitro party that had dozens and dozens of people squeezed into a tiny room watching an even tinier TV. Chris Benoit versus Hammer. <laughs> Still no Raven. It's been like six weeks. You know, this kind of made me want to see Benoit versus Kurgan. Oh, my. He got a hell of a match out of Hammer. Hammer's better than Kurgan. Dude, this was the only good match I think that Hammer ever had in his whole life. That's true. <laughs> That's one more than Kurgan. I mean, listen. Hammer got his ass kicked for maybe two minutes. Benoit just beat him and beat him and beat him and beat him. And finally, Hammer's going to get the heat. His first move of the match. And it is a falling powerbomb into the buckle. And he fucks it up. Yeah, he does. Really bad. Oh, he almost... <laughs> he uh, almost dropped Benoit on his head. Upside down. So, they're brawling on the floor. Actually, I will say this. Benoit whipped him into the apron. Hammer took a mighty bump for that bump into the apron. Well, that's because he almost killed him. <laughs> well, there you Minutes go. before. Yeah. The flock attacks... 
Eventually, Saturn hits a clothesline for the DQ, and the segment ends with Benoit prone as the flock, well, they just surround him. Still no Raven. Now, Tanae said the rings of Saturn were lethal. <laughs> Only if you fly into them. I should also note, is Raven Benoit Starcade? Shouldn't it be Raven Saturn? Shouldn't it be Saturn versus Benoit? Should. It He's, seems that way. Saturn's been the one that lays out Benoit every single week. You should have to go through Saturn to get to Raven. And do, and do Raven. Which maybe it's what the they did. I don't even now. remember if that's what they did at Starcade. The flock but. jumps him every week, and Saturn ends with the rings of Saturn yeah. on him every week. So yeah. Benoit should have to go through Saturn to get to Raven. I yeah. bet you that's a good match. Oh, sure. Both of them. You think so? After he had a good match with Hammer? I'm almost positive. <laughs> <laughs> the incredulous look on Brian's face just now. Uh, we had Jim Kelly and Bruce Smith throwing those horrible punches at Randy Savage a while back. Why did they re-air this? A still photo here would have been just fine. Although they were still better than Reggie White. So after the break, the NWO has begun to take over the announce desk. <laughs> and that is when we realized, oh no. Now listen, I'm not going to lie. If you add in commercials, they spent 20 minutes redesigning the set. Uh-huh. Can you imagine? <laughs> now, I'm actually going to say something positive about this. Rick Rude okay. was there as foreman. <laughs> <laughs> this, it's funny because it's true. This fucking guy was walking around and commanding everybody to put on NWO t-shirts. I was in my room seeing if I had one. <laughs> I was scared shitless. Scott Norton is out there trying to intimidate guys, and I'm like, this is phony. Like, (laughs) Rick Rude, I was reading, I was looking through the Observer report of this show. Dave was so not a fan of Rick Rude on commentary. Hmm. He was so wrong. Rick Rude was the star of this show. Rick Rude running around and telling all these guys to run that pyro. And put this shirt on. He's just commanding everybody to do all of this stuff. And then he did. He was so good on commentary. I thought he was great on this show. And I also realized. I also realized. You know, when the NWO is doing something. And every now and then there's the NWO announcer's voice comes in. Do, do, do world order or whatever. And then there's a fellow who laughs. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. It's fucking itchweed. It might be. Next time, I want you to listen. You'll never not be able to see Itchweed's face when you hear that guy laughing. Now I know where he got it. That's the only good thing about this. 20 minutes of hell. Yeah, we had... Let me tell you what it was like watching this on the network. This... I forget if I said this already. I missed this when it first happened, but boy, did I hear about it for years. This is actually the first time I've ever actually watched the episode start to finish. And the last, I will add. (laughs) So... There is 12 minutes of TV time. Now, as Brian noted, when you put the, put in the, there were two commercial breaks in there, so that takes it to 20 minutes. It's 20 minutes of no announcers, no narration, no little crawler across the screen to say what's going on. It's just uh, ambient arena noise, which is often Rick Rude yelling at people. Sometimes it's Buff Bagwell cackling. Sometimes it's Vincent not doing anything. They're just out there. They're putting shirts on, guys. Conan goes to the uh, production truck to make sure the AV crew gets suitably harassed. They're putting banners all over the place. They're taking down... They, they took down those big, huge, chrome WCW letters on the stage. They lowered stuff from the ceiling. It's funny. When they were taking the WCW... Like, the, the steel-plated um, WCW sign down, mm-hmm. the guy was using a grinder, and he had a pipe in one hand, and he had the grinder in the other. And you know, it was just making sparks. He wasn't actually cutting into the... I see. You know what I mean? Yeah. Craig wanted to share his lingo. Well. Which is cool. <laughs> so, <laughs> the weird thing is, in a strange way, I won't say I like this, but I've seen a lot of stuff I hated more. Many of it on Raw on the same night. There was something kind of peaceful about this nothing happening for a while. <laughs> it did not last, this feeling I had of piece so the payoff for all this is that first nothing happens for a while then eric bischoff comes out on a motorcycle that looks way too big for him he cuts a promo 
calls out the entire NWO, and they come out slowly. By the way, where were all the rest of the WCW wrestlers while this was all going on? Well, as we'll get to here, apparently they hadn't arrived yet. Yeah, they were showing up late. <laughs> Maybe that was Bischoff's plan. They're so hmm. committed to this He called all show. the WCW guys and said, we're starting an hour late. Called all the Uber drivers and said, take the long way. Just hang out. <laughs> so, they walk, and they mosey, and they saunter, and they stroll, and they get in the ring, and it is time to give Christmas presents to Hulk Hogan. The first present was this show. <laughs> I'd have punched Eric right in the face. <laughs> They begin to drop flyers from the ceiling that read Merry Christmas Hollywood. They presented a motorcycle. Two. They presented a second motorcycle. They bring out a stretch limo complete with hot girls soaking their feet in a hot tub in the back. A heart shaped hot tub, by the way. That's correct. At which point Hogan said, Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> See what he did there? That's what he said. Yeah. yeah. There's only two girls. Though. That was apparently like a shocking line in 1997. Oh, I'm sure it was. I'm yeah. sure that was he full of scandal. believe Hulk Hogan said, ho, 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 when the chicks came out. Man. The Hulkster. And that was the most offensive thing Hulk Hogan ever said. Edgy. Somewhere in here, by the way, Eric Bischoff randomly announces, okay, let's go three hours. No. <laughs> so they go to commercial break. Then Rick Steiner and Ted DiBiase are shown arriving at the building. We're only 90 minutes into Nitro at this point. Where the hell have you two been? JJ says, I do not blame you if you want to take the night off. There will be no repercussions because JJ's lost all control. They said they would go out anywhere. So we got Rick Steiner versus Scott Norton. Bischoff, Rude, and Nash doing commentary. From the end of the Lucha match to this one, on the network, we went 26 minutes with no wrestling. When you put in the commercial breaks, it had to be about 45. So, Norton and Rick had a terrible match. Rude. Rude was awesome. Here he was awesome. I, I, he was he was going off about how Sting had broken his neck in Japan and ended his career and deserved payback from Hogan at Starcade. Bischoff asks Nash, what do you want for Christmas? And Nash replies, a great big bag of money. I also want this, if any of you are uh, still shopping. Send me a great big bag of money. Rick goes for a avalanche belly-to-belly. This may have been worse than the side slam Kurgan did. Pretty sure this was his... Uh, wait, which one? Uh, Norton and Rick Steiner. I know, but what spot? The belly-to-belly. Off the middle rope? Yeah. Yep. yeah. I'm pretty sure this was his receipt. Absolutely. I see. See, let's just think about these Steiners. Like... Norton wasn't, he didn't have his feet on the outside of the ropes. He had his feet on the inside. Like he was sitting on the top rope. So his feet were inside the ring. Rick climbed up so his feet were also on the inside. So there's no possible way, because his feet are going to get caught on the ropes, that Norton could actually flip out of this. And Rick just threw him anyway. Fucking just dropped the dude right on his shoulder and his back. What a... Car wreck. Yeah, these two need to never wrestle each other again. Eventually, someone will die. Anyway, NWO ran in for the DQ. Scott Steiner and Ray Trailer made the save. It was an awful match. We had clips of Dennis Rodman wrestling. We had it Nash. I would like to add one thing about the Rick versus Norton match. When the NWO came down, and then the baby faces came down to save the day, Ray Trailer's down there. They're running off the NWO. And as the NWO is running away, Ted DiBiase sees Virgil. Mm -hmm. And he kicks him right in the ass. <laughs> I laughed. Just for old time's sake. Yep. Probably not the first time that happened. So they just had clips of Robin wrestling. Nash ran down Giant for a while. Kurt Hennig versus Disco Inferno. <laughs> first of all, I love that... Kurt Hennig signs the WCW. I'm sure it was a ton of money. And they said, we're putting you in the NWO. He said, great, I'll be a top guy out of the gate. And they said, we'll need to get a black and white singlet. And he said, fuck you, I'm wrestling in teal. <laughs> that was it. He was the only guy in the NWO who did not wrestle in black and white. This was a six-minute squash match. Yeah. And Disco's a TV champion. And it felt like six hours. 
You know what I did love about this is Hennig beats his ass with a look of utter disgust on his face. That he's in there with this man that has shake your ass on his booty. I was watching Something it. Something like that. Whatever it says, shake your booty is it on his your, ass. Shake your booty on his ass, yes. Okay. Well, it's the same fucking thing, Craig, <laughs> obviously. But anyway, I was watching it and I thought, Hennig is a badass. And you know who else is a badass? His buddy Rick Rude. And I thought, can you imagine that in the whole history of wrestling... They were never a regular tag team. Yeah, best friends. Can you imagine what an awesome tag team Kurt Hennig and Rick Rude would have been together? Perfectly rude. Oh, Ooh, nice. man. Ravishing perfection. Ooh, I like that. I yeah. was so sad watching this show. Rick Rude's on commentary. He's so great. And, like, is dead two years later. Yeah. God. It sucks. He was awesome. I'm such a fan of Rick Rude now. Between this and his 1980s stuff on the yeah. Saturday Night Live, I was watching. And He's I didn't appreciate so him awesome. enough when I was young because I was such a Warrior fan. So I was always just happy to see Warrior beat Rick Rude's ass. Well, the other thing, and I could be wrong on this if I went back and watched some of his WWF stuff. In WWF, they, fo- they made him a narcissist. Yes. He was a pretty boy. In these two shows, while he has a phenomenal, phenomenal physique, he's mostly just a badass. Yeah. He's mostly into beating the fuck out of He's like, if you don't let off that pyro, I'm going to kill you. Yeah. And you're like, where's the button? It's funny, too, because he wears a suit and everything, and you're still frightened of him. You don't have any clues to what his it physique is. It is because he's got, a pa- he's got a badass tough guy face. Exactly. Yeah. Like, I don't know how he pulled off that mustache. But <laughs> it's like, he pulled it off. Yeah. I'm not making one comment about his mustache. No. And he had a voice. He had a great heel voice. He had a an air of gravity about him. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Like he's 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 half Braun Strowman size and eighty times scarier. Yep. <laughs> so uh, Bobby Heenan comes out to the desk. And he begins to suck up to Bischoff because he wants a job. He says you are the number one promoter in wrestling. This is the top organization. You're the kind of person I need to work for. And eventually they agreed to let him take Kevin. He Nash's called spot. Eric Bischoff the Donald Trump of wrestling. I was going to bring that up. <laughs> but he called him that. He called him, you are the Donald Trump of wrestling. And uh, coincidentally, everyone, WCW is dead four years later. I'm just saying. <laughs> so eventually they agreed to let him take Nash's spot. And Nash was like, I'll take the night off. Whatever. <laughs> Didn't have to twist his arm. That guy was useless. <laughs> <laughs> he was useless on commentary. Was he not? He, maybe he knew it was coming. He didn't want to watch anymore. I think he was asleep. There, He was not... It was, he was not Rick Rude. There was like one good line. Or he was he afraid to, to say something and make Rude mad. That's possible too. <laughs> okay. Harlem Heat versus Lodi and Riggs. One of the few highlights in this show were the white guys in Cosby sweaters dancing to Harlem Heat's music. So this was fucking atrocious. Just an appalling match. They beat up Riggs for a while, but at least he was competent. So they gave him some stuff. And they tagged in Lodi. And Lodi sucks. And everyone knows it. They beat the hell out of him for several minutes. Riggs got bored and left. Days went by. They had a thousand moves in a row. Eventually they won with the elevated sidekick. Which apparently, according to these little uh, buttons on the network thing. uh, The Big Apple Blast. You have bubbles on your thing? Yeah. You know, the the, the timeline goes by. And you can click on the worst at the start of the match. The end of it. Yep. Really? Yeah, the huh. Big Apple Blast is what they called the finish to this. Wow. I watched it on the iPad. It doesn't have that. I might not there. I'm going to say one thing about this. So this show is absolutely sucking. And I'm not saying that this match didn't suck, because it really ended up sucking. And when it was over, I wrote, this show sucks. This was a seven-minute squash match. But when they got rid of Nash, and they replaced him with Bobby Heenan, and then they got rid of Eric, and they replaced him with Mike Tanay, and we had three announcers who actually were talking about the show and the matches... Fucking totally turned around. It is amazing when you have commentators that are competent. They make the show better. Let me write that down. It's funny, too. You should, because it's it's a mystery in WWE today. After the match was over, Bobby uh, gets the mic. He says, uh, uh, Miss, Miss, Mr. Rude, can I, can I handle the, uh, the replay on this? As permission. He, he, he was out there. Sucking up to and being afraid of the NWO, and he never forgot that. There's no point where he talked over them. Because he was a professional. Yeah. 
He never talked over them. He was never... He, he always made it clear he was significantly below their level. The other thing that was great is Tanae's there, and so they start talking about the Starcade card. Start talking about Hogan versus Sting. Sting is a trigger word for Rick Rude. Yes. <laughs> Rick Rude is so angry that Sting broke his neck and put him in a recliner where he says, and I quote, my poor wife had to look at my face for a year. He is livid, steaming mad. And he lets us all know if he ever gets his hands on Sting, there's trouble to be had. It was great. <laughs> I thought if I were Sting, I am not coming down from these rafters. <laughs> it's so great. He started off talking about how the key is when it happened, he was the world champion and on, on the top of his career. And it was over in an instant because of Sting. God, he was great. Chris Jericho versus Buff Bagwell. Hey, Jericho tried so hard because these fans never recovered. I know it's hard to believe that a 45-minute intermission in a three-hour show would kill the crowd, but it killed the crowd. And then we got, what, another half hour of just straight squashes. They were dead, and there was no getting them back, but Jericho tried so hard to get them back into this match. Failed, but tried. It's a great finish on this on this one. This finish was awesome, actually, yes. So it's a Nitro match. It's fine. Uh, Jericho's making his comeback. He goes for a top rope Rana, but Bagwell shoves him down. So Jericho flips flips and lands on his feet. And Bagwell immediately pops up, jumps and flips, and he's flipping the same direction, so it looks cool. And he hits the blockbuster and gets the win. That was cool. And then he beat up the ref. No reason. <laughs> Accusations of by ass is what it was. Mm. So remember like 40 minutes ago when the NWO came out for, a, 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 the whole gang came out for a promo? Yep. The NWO came out for a promo. Again. This, this was where I gave up. This show, this is one of the worst wrestling TV episodes I've ever seen. You know what though, Vinny, let me, let me somewhat defend this. Now don't get me wrong, I also was ready to turn off the show, but the one thing that I will say about WCW is... I could at least see what they thought they were trying to do. And what they were trying to do here was, when this segment was over, as a fan, you were supposed to be praying that Larry Zbysko would beat Eric Bischoff so we never had to see NWO Nitro again. <laughs> and you were supposed to be praying that Sting would beat Hogan and end his title reign. That was the idea, and it wasn't bad on paper, but it was complete overkill because the goddamn show was three hours long, and they came out over and over and over and over again. There was a method to this madness, but they just went way over the line. I was so sick of this show at this point, and not in like a good way. Like, I can't wait till Starcade. It was like, I can't wait to never watch this show again. So they had more presents for Hogan, a big shiny ring. He had a huge mock-up of his 1980s Sports Illustrated cover they lowered from the ceiling. They showed Thunderlips choking Rocky Balboa. Here, Hulk, here's the last good movie you made 15 years ago. It went on for a while, and it went to commercial, and that was it. I really would have liked it if they would have had a Escape from Devil's Mountain promo or something, a poster come down from the ceiling. Three ninjas. Three ninjas on Devil's Island or whatever the fuck it was. It's amazing, too. When you saw the banners, you could actually see that people were still in the stands. That is astonishing. Exactly. Actually, it's been like an hour at this point since the show had just gone deep off a cliff. It's hard to drive off people that bought a ticket, you know what I mean? I mean, it happens sometimes, but it's much different watching on TV for free when there's other channels. There's right. basically two kinds of people for sporting events, and uh, this qualifies. There's people who I don't, There's people who say... I don't care what's going on, how close or exciting it is. I'm not getting caught in traffic. I'm leaving 15 minutes early. And there's people who say, I don't care how terrible this is. I paid my ticket. I'm going to get every minute out of this. And this apparently was all the latter group. Unless it's the home team and they're getting killed. And there's still people who will say, I paid my money. I'm not going to leave. Anyway, uh, let's see. Randy Savage. Oh, the limo left. Important note. Randy Savage versus Lex Luger. Savage came out and dedicated the match to the Hulkster. They had a lame match. Luger takes out the ref. NWO runs out and attacks Lex. He gets power bombed and elbow dropped. <laughs> Rick Rude. When the ref gets bumped, Rude is 
just demanding a DQ. And Mike Tanay tries to calmly say, it was an accident. And Rude just goes off. That's not an accident! Of course that should be a D! He's freaking out! Save this match for me. <laughs> the other great thing Rude did, there were several matches ago, but I remember it now. He was so good at the, the and it's you know an old school wrestling announcer thing. You just throw out some bullshit, but it sounds like you know what you're talking about and making an observation. You know, Stevie Ray's, looks like he's slimmed up. He's much quicker. Yeah, it's Stevie Ray. <laughs> he's as fat as slow as ever. Yeah. So, yeah, Lex gets powerbombed and elbow dropped, and they roll the ref back in to count three. As God is my witness, Eric Bischoff <laughs> and Hulk Hogan came back out. I want you all to listen to Vinny recap. This. This was the final angle before yeah. Starcade. I'm sure that you can probably imagine things like, Oh, man, remember when the guy came out in the sting mask? And he thought it was a fake sting, but then he took his mask off and it was a real sting and he beat up the whole NWO? Man, that was cool. Remember this, remember that? Let's recap what happened here in this go-home angle for Starcade, the biggest pay-per-view of all time in WCW. So Hogan and Bischoff are running their mouths. A final present for the Hulkster arrives. He's very excited to see this package. Eric is like, well, Hulk, that's not for me. That must be from Scott or Kevin or something. Hulk takes the package. At exactly this point, because it's WCW, the limo pulls back in and Bret Hart's hanging out with the women. And he abandons them to go walk up the aisle and smile at Hulk. And this is going on at the exact same time Hulk opens, oh, Hulk opens the package. So not that it was going to be any good anyway, but it was as bad as it possibly could have been. Yeah, you missed the opening. Yeah, the, 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 the actual reveal you missed. So this uh, essentially was the end of seven, as done in WCW. Hulk Hogan opens the box and finds his own head. <laughs> I don't know if I ever used this term on the show, but I did a spit take. <laughs> Hogan is in the ring with a package, and I couldn't remember what was in it. I thought, it must be a sting mask That's or something. exactly what I thought it was going to be, yep. too, yes. And they cut to Bret Hart, and Bret Hart is walking down the aisle in his leather jacket, and for some reason, as he's walking, he has to open it up a little more, so it's kind of falling off his shoulders. Right. Like, That's he's a Bret his Hart own prom move. date. Yeah. And then, all of a sudden, they cut from Bret Hart, and Hulk Hogan's looking at his own head. Yeah. And I fucking start spit with laughter. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck? His, his own yeah. head? So, what? So there's <laughs> there's this Hulk head in the box, and the Hulk head is posed in a, with a screaming face. Yeah. And the real Hulkster is also screaming. Oh no, he says, it's my head. He's selling for his own head. Right. He's never been so scared in his life. And he's screaming and looking around. He's turning the head back and forth, so it's screaming and looking around. And I don't want to alarm you. I don't know how many seven, eight thousand people were there. None of them thought this was cool. <laughs> you no. don't say. <laughs> Not one person. So what you've got is Hulk Hogan screaming. He's the only person in this whole arena making any noise. Now, if the Hulk head had looked at Hogan, and then out of its mouth came Hulk's arm to point at the Hulkster? Something like that. That would have been cool. Yes. Didn't happen. They found something much cooler to end the show with. Well, so... The announcers aren't saying anything. The fans aren't saying anything. Hulk is screaming at his head. This was <laughs> so cringeworthy. I felt bad for the Hulkster here. So Brett smiles, and then behind Brett, up on top of the stage, way back yonder, is Sting with a zip line. Excuse me? Sting with a zip line. A zip line? Yes. yes. So... Hogan is now scared more because now he has to deal with not only his own head, but Sting. He's slowly coming at me. <laughs> Sting. <laughs> I've never done a zip line. The closest I've done is watching the South Park episode where they went zip lining, where Cartman goes on a zip line. It takes about three minutes to get to the end, and they say, Was it cool? And he says, No, nah, dude, it's hella lame. So Sting goes on the zip line. He's rolling. <laughs> I can't say he was actually any farther away from the ring, but at times it did not appear he was getting any closer. Hogan is screaming and screaming and screaming. Because he's trapped. Because he's trapped in the ring. Trapped in a fucking 18-foot ring. 
Sting finally gets close enough th- to the ring that he has to lift his feet to go over the ropes. <laughs> Doesn't cross over them yet. No. He just lifts his feet. Hogan begins to dive for the side of the ring when he remembers there's no cage here. Sting could have walked to the ring quicker than this zip line <laughs> took him. An actual scorpion would have made the trip faster. Sting lifts his legs to get over the rope. Hogan begins to dive towards the rope. The screen fades to black. <laughs> that is the go-home moment. That's the end. <laughs> My jaw hung open. Sting. What have I just seen? Sting came to the ring on a zip line. <laughs> this they, man's been falling from the ceiling right. week after week after week after week. And the go home angle is he comes down on a zip line. And I don't know if you remember this or not. I could be wrong here, but I'm 99.9% positive that I'm right. At Starcade. He just walks down the aisle. Yeah. They play a video and he comes out with his coat and bat. <sighs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Dude. Even a fucking zip line. Even their dumb video game, which had a Royal Rumble mode for some reason, when Sting came out with the Rumble, he didn't come out from the back. He descended from the ceiling because it was cool. Huh. That's how the show ended. Bloom was off the rows. And they still... You know, a moment ago, I said it was the biggest pay-per-view that WCW had ever done, which is a fact. But, if I recall correctly, that was the biggest pay-per-view anyone had ever done up to that point. Pretty sure. Off this. Well, no, off of what they'd done for the prior 18 months. Well, yeah. But, but yes, off this. Just so wacky. That was it. Next week... I think we should watch the match. Hogan Sting? Just watch Hogan Sting. Everybody wants us to watch it. To marvel. So we'll watch that and we'll do the uh, the report next week. We are at war! Well, moving on to that. It was Hulk Hogan and Sting in the main event of Starcade 1997. December 28th. Sting's entrance with the laser show and a child's voice reading a poem about, about a dark warrior fighting an army out of the shadows. It was simultaneously the corniest thing ever and also the coolest thing ever. It was very 1997, this light show. Yeah, that's true. They do a stare down. Tony is sure to point out how big Sting's arms are, which is funny considering Eric Bischoff's later claim where it looked like Sting had not lifted a weight in months. So... They did a lot of nothing. Hogan a would do like lot an arm of nothing. Hogan they would did do an mostly arm nothing. Sting would hit a drop kick. Hogan would bail and and uh, bigger with the fans. And the whole thing is, Sting is just doing his mime act. So his face is blank the entire time. He's doing nothing. He's not interacting with the crowds. He's not showing any emotion. The whole thing is just the Hogan show, who's just celebrating when he's on top. He's selling when he's when, when he's selling. And the in between, he's bailing and messing around with the fans. You know, this was like, this wasn't even like a main event on a pay per view for sure. It was like a house show match, but it wasn't even like a house show main event match. It was like a third match on the sh- like a third match on the card house show match with an old veteran against a guy who'd been in the business like three months. That's what this match was. It was like your match with Stony Edwards, which I believe uh, was your first match. Yeah. Until the supposed fast count, that is exactly what this was. Sting didn't even show up. He was just out there like a rag doll. It was none of the old Sting. There was no fire. There was no charisma. It may have well, the fake Sting would have done a better job in this match. That is probably true. Uh. Let, you know the the, the the legacy of this match is that Sting got screwed, and it's true. But it's also true that Sting was taking the night off. Oh, he took the biggest the, the 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 biggest match the company ever had. Well, well let's jump ahead here very quickly because I want to talk about that. So Nick Patrick does the supposed fast count. They do an atomic drop, and then Hogan hits the big boot, and you think, ah, this is a setup for the leg drop of Doom. Hogan hits a leg drop of doom. You're thinking, oh, now Sting's going to kick out of his move and fire up. But Nick Patrick drops down and he counts one, two, three. Just like that. 
pins a guy. They, <laughs> I don't know if they must not have. Either Tony Schiavone didn't know the finish or he was baffled that they didn't do a fast count because he counted along and he goes, one, two, and he just stops. <laughs> it's yeah. a three count. It's like, wait, what? And they immediately cut outside and there's Bret Hart refusing to let the timekeeper ring the bell. Now, apparently Bret Hart can see the future. Apparently, Bret Hart started walking to the ring three minutes ago knowing that Hulk Hogan was going to hit the leg drop, Sting wasn't going to kick out, and the referee was going to give a fast count. Because he was prepared. It wasn't like he was at ringside for this match. He just magically appeared. And he claimed it was a fast count, which it wasn't, and then they restarted the match. Now, here's the key. When they restarted this match, we got the old Sting. He fired up. He was running wild. He was howling. The place was going crazy. He hits his moves. The NWO comes out. He beats up all of them. He puts a dude in the sharpshooter. Hulk Hogan submits. He wins. He celebrates. All the guys come out. I was like, where were you for the first 15 minutes of this match? Or 12 minutes or 10 minutes or whatever the first part was. Like, he was Sting once they restarted the match. Why didn't he do that for the first half of the match? Did he realize what was going on and how shit it was going to be and so he didn't even try? And then he went crazy when he was actually going to win? What the hell happened here? I don't have any answers. Those were all good questions. Uh, it was very strange. The last, and the funny thing is, the last 90 seconds, it was like everyone just pretended that count had been fast. Yeah, because it was supposed to be. Including the fans, though. The fans are very happy to see see Sting fire up. They were happy to see him beat up Hulk Hogan for 90 seconds. They were happy to see him fight off the two NWO members who hit the ring. They were happy to see him win. So he gets the win. Bret Hart calls for the bell. And then we get a great celebration. The first guy in the ring is his best friend, Lex Luger. Big hug there. Next guy in the ring is the other WCW hero and the big guy, the giant, who could hold him up high amidst the crowd. They grabbed every warm body they could find and said, go celebrate with Sting so this looks cool. Luther Reigns was out there. That's right. Yep. And uh, everyone just pretended like we had not just seen Sting pinned clean as a sheet just a few minutes ago. It was so weird because when I watched his comeback after Brett restarted the match, I thought, you know what? If you fuckers would have just come out here and only done that, like Michael Buffer introduces the men, instead of just walking down the aisle, Sting comes out of House of Fire, he hits the ring, he runs wild on Hogan, he's beating the hell out of him pillar to post, NWO runs in, Sting beats them all up, grabs the guy, puts him in the sharpshooter, Hulk Hogan submits, Sting's the new champion. Like they did with Goldberg and Brock Lesnar at Survivor Series. If they would have done that, like, the company was still going to die. They'd have fucked everything else up. But that would have been such a great ending to the whole NWO story and the Sting story and everything else. And the next day, the NWO is gone or they're downplayed and now you move on with your lives and you start a new storyline and you start a new build to the next Starcade or whatever, or you build to Sting and Goldberg, whatever you're going to do. It would have been so great. But... They had to do what they did. I mean, I don't know. Apparently, even even if they had done a fast count, Hogan was supposed to, like, get a lot of offense in because he was losing. It's like, fuck off, dude. <laughs> this is Starcade. You've been building this up for a year. You don't need shit in this match. Just go out there and put the guy over. The fuck do you need to beat the guy up for? That's stupid. This whole thing was, it's more painful now than it was at the time. It's bewildering. I watched this. Knowing Everybody everything involved gonna, should have been fired the next day. I watched this knowing everything that was going to happen almost minute for minute, and I was still blown away when it actually happened. Like, it, how how was Nick Patrick not fired the next day? How? I don't know. Fucked up the biggest finish in the history of the company. How do you not fire the guy? How do you not fire Bischoff? Because he's overseeing this debacle. How the fuck did they not go through that with a flaming sword and just fire fuckers left and right after this? Well, that was Starcade. And it led to Nitro the next night, one number 120, also December 29th. Where they also spent the whole show pretending that the count was fast. 
as they're Are plugging, you? as they're plugging the Tuesday replay of the pay per view, where you can buy it and see that it wasn't a fast count. And then they Hogan actually, comes out later and tells the truth. They actually said you can buy the pay per view and judge for yourself. Yeah. Are you familiar with the term gaslighting? Uh, no. It is, make a long story short, it is telling someone the same lie over and over again to the point where they start to believe it. So you mean wrestling? <laughs> well, it's sort of, but specifically on the show, WCW is gaslighting their fans. As Tony said over, over, over and over again, it was a fast count, it was a fast count, it was a fast count. That's the story of Hogan's career, gaslighting. That should have been his finish. I guess so. So, yeah, it was quite strange. And every time they, uh, every time they said that, I said, "No, no, I just watched it. You're lying to me. It was a, it was a clean count." So the show opens. They welcome Larry Zbysko for saving the company, but they went over Eric Bischoff. Tony Schiavone then offered the following words, and this is a quote. <laughs> this was the best part of the show. For you, eighteen to twenty-five young men who still live with your mom, who don't have a job, who are NWO fans, let me suggest the Cartoon Network. <laughs> I'm sure Space Ghost Coast to Coast is on right now. What an oddly specific and bitter rant. <laughs> it wasn't just that. I love the part when he goes, as we all know, NWO is for losers. And he holds the L up yeah. to his head. <laughs> Tony Schiavone. Yeah. It's fucking great. Glacier versus Bill Goldberg. Glacier's still doing his full entrance with the snow and the lasers and the kata. He, all this time, making him look like a star, and Goldberg comes out to kill him and wins with his spear and jackhammer in a minute. Oh, yeah. Nearly killed and him the, with his spear. And the place goes ape shit for Goldberg. That was actually awesome. Gene brings out Bret Hart for a promo. Bret pledges allegiance to WCW. So the NWO is corrupt scum, just like the scum he left behind. He starts putting over all the guys he wants to wrestle in WCW, Luger, Giant, Benoit, Sting, all the guys in the NWO, and says the big target he wants most of all is Hulk Hogan. He says, Hogan's been running for him for a long time, and now, now there's nowhere to run or hide. It's time to step in the ring with me. This was a good promo, but Bret Hart's promos as a heel are a thousand times better. Like a thousand oh, yeah. times better. Of course, the story is, when Hulk Hogan was champion in WWF, he refused to drop it to Bret Hart because Bret was too small. Is that a dog? That was me coughing. Oh. So, yeah, now he's coming back for revenge on the Hulkster now that Yokozuna's out of the picture. Yes. Raven from the stands cuts a promo. He said Saturn had beaten Chris Benoit the night before. Just as so he they did my been. idea. Yes, Raven did not wrestle Benoit at the pay-per-view. I didn't even know they were going to do that. I totally forgot. But that was what made sense, and they actually did it. It's kind of amazing the things they do that make sense and the things they do that don't make sense. Well, it is WCW. The things they do that don't make sense are amazing. So basically he says that if uh, he and his men had been beating Benoit for weeks, and if Benoit's going to keep coming out to fight, we're going to keep beating him up. So you had Hammer versus Chris Benoit. Hammer. Benoit come- yeah. Benoit comes out, dives over the rail onto Raven and his crew. They kick his ass because there's like eight of them and feed him to Hammer. Hammer goes for his delayed superplex, nearly loses Benoit and drops him to the floor. Unfortunately, he hit it. He missed a wacky corner charge, and Benoit hooks the crossface and the flock attacks for the DQ. At this point, Mongo runs out to make the save. Mongo brawling with Riggs and then Hammer. No good. <laughs> you don't say. No good at all. You know, I didn't watch it, but they actually did the Goldberg Mongo match at Survivor Series. And Dave gave it minus one star. Called it atrocious. I'm sure it was. I don't know. I'd like to see it. <clears throat> so the X Horseman cleared the ring. Raven was shown watching from the stands. Rick Flair came out for a promo. He congratulated all of the WCW guys for their wins at the pay-per-view and calls out Bret Hart. He says, it's a good thing you're finally here in the big leagues, but I couldn't help but note 
you gave a long, long list of guys you'd like to face earlier, and my name did not come up. He pulls out a copy of the Baltimore Sun, and it says, at my age, you need these, and he puts on spectacles. And then he begins to scour the page that he has brought out because he didn't think to highlight it first. He looks so much like Grandpa Flair here. Finally, he says, here's a quote from Bret Hart's main man, Dave Meltzer. He said Flair was the greatest in the history of the sport without question. This made him happy, and he celebrated. <laughs> this was bizarre. It was so wacky. This would only happen in 1997 in WCW. Pretty much. Ultimo Dragon versus Eddie Guerrero. They have like 90 seconds. They are both dressed exactly the same, so they're like tag team partners. That annoyed me. And then Dragon won. He reversed whatever Eddie was going for. It's a Dragon Sleeper. Tapped him out to win the Cruiserweight title. Then as soon as the bell rang, Eddie beat him up and threw him out of the ring. What the hell was this? Well, they decided we got to change every single solitary title. So they changed one here. In a minute and a half. In a minute and a half. And it's about the and best the... 90 seconds you've ever seen in wrestling, I might add. It was very good wrestling while they were out there, but then they had the loser beat up the winner just to make sure the title change didn't matter anyway. Well, you got to make sure you set up that rematch. I suppose. Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff came out for a promo. They showed it. J.J. Dillon announcing at Starkey that Nick Patrick would be the ref. This showed it was WCW's call, not the bearers. And they said Nick Patrick had called for the bell and declared Hogan the winner and champion. This was all true. They said Bret Hart had interfered after the match was done and lied to the world. This was all true. They set up a sneak attack by Sting, which is not true. But then Bret raised to Sting's hand, and that was that. Hogan ran his mouth for a while, claimed he'd still be the champion. Bobby Heenan comes back to rejoin the announce desk. Shivani and Tania are like, no, no, we saw you sucking up to the NWO last week. He says, I had gone running into the burning house, sacrificing myself for WCW in the tradition of pro wrestling. And he just sits back down and goes to work no matter what they say. <laughs> yeah. Well, everything they said he took is an okay that he's back. Like he would say, I want my job back. And Tony would say, tonight? And Heenan would respond to, tonight? By saying, thank you, and sit down. Yes. Tony's laughing by the end of this. Heenan is so good. It was great. And the funny thing was, he said that he did what he had to do for the WCW fans last week. And I thought, you know what? He's absolutely right, because that fucking commentary was so horrible until he showed up. So he did save the day, and he should be welcomed back with open arms. That is true. In Mortis versus DDP... I like how Paige's gimmick is he wrestles in tape ribs to let you know his ribs are hurt. That yeah. he never actually sells his ribs as he's swapping <laughs> around the ring or hitting the ropes. Because they're taped. Yeah, I guess so. Did a lot of stuff, way more than they needed to. And then Paige reversed the Samoan drop into a diamond cutter for the win. I got nothing to add. All right. Oakland interviewed J.J. Dillon. J.J. said there had been a championship match and a decision had been rendered. The decision was final and that is that. I talked to Sting. Sting says he's willing to defend his title tonight. If Hogan or anyone else from the NWO wants to come face him, Sting will fight. Disco Inferno versus Booker T. Can you imagine this was the post-Starcade edition of this show? Nothing's yeah. happening! Well, this was something. I mean, it's, it's a so title TV. change, but, like, it's just a bunch of matches on this show. Yeah, well, they're, 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 it's true. The fallout of Starcade was pretty much Sting is champion now, but everything else is still the same. Yeah. Yeah. So, Disco, in case you'd forgotten, like I had, was the TV champion at this point. This match is a fun little brawl, actually. I enjoyed this. My favorite part, I see these every week now. Disco has Booker T in a chin lock or something. And he's talking to the guy. And he's talking. 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 And I'm like, what the fuck is the spot? Do it already. And the big spot is, hit the ropes, watch the knee. And then he put yeah. it back in a chin lock again. Yeah. It's like, how many times were you spelling it? 
So Booker makes his comeback, and he hits the Harlem Hangover, and he wins. That's right. A move Bobby Heenan said he'd never seen Booker T do before. It was his first singles championship in WCW. He looks in the camera, wishes his son a happy birthday, turns around, there's his brother, Stevie Ray. They're celebrating. Between this and the sting in the end of Starcade, WCW really knew how to have guys celebrate when they won a championship. Hey, yeah. Dylan comes out, says nobody in the NWO has responded yet, but then out comes, out comes Bischoff, who accepts the challenge on Hogan's behalf and warns Dylan not to screw it up. Chris Jericho versus Kurt Hennig. Man, they weren't a tag team, but they paired Hennig and Rude up here. It was awesome. Rick, Rick Rude was in Hennig's corner. His mustache was not. Oh, my God. You know... There are very, very few men that can pull off a mustache. I'm talking only a mustache. Not the goatee, not the beard. Just a mustache. And Rick Rude, he was not only so much of a man that he could pull off just a mustache, but when he got rid of the mustache, it was a negative. (laughs) That's the amazing part. Yeah. He looked very human. He looked looked better better with a a mustache. Can you imagine? I've never seen a man like that before. Maybe Don Fry. Who is also manly, by the way. It's true. I suspect Don Fry and Rick Rude would have gotten along swell. Oh, man. What a team they'd have been. So they're doing this match, and something gets fucked up early, and Hennig bails. They get back, and they're, they're doing the match more. Hennig was extra pissed after the uh, first fuck up. He takes Jericho to the corner and beats him up for a while. Then he gives Jericho the uh, you know Jericho his his chance back. But then Jericho makes his comeback and he tries the uh, quebrada, the moonsault off the ropes. He comes up way 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 short and probably would have fallen on his head and died. But Henry got his knees up to break his fall, and Henry's like hell with this, and he immediately hits the fisherman suplex for the win. The ref counts three, and then Hennig... As the ref is raising his hand, keep in mind he pinned him with a suplex. It's not like he was on top of him. You know, it's not like he had been on top of him anyway. The ref raises Hennig's hand, and Hennig sits on Jericho's face just to annoy him. <laughs> yeah. Blatantly, blatantly teabagging him on national TV. Jericho shoves him away, goes to ringside, throws a tantrum saying he's sick of this. Like, I, I'm, I'm sure it's probably the start of his heel turn because that's coming up here soon. But uh, it sure came off like. He was sick of having Kurt Hennig's ass on his head. You know, it was weird. I could not figure out for the life of me what the hell was going on with that lion salt. I thought, I thought that he meant to not rotate and land on the guy's knees, which would be really, really stupid and potentially deadly. So, I don't know who did what or why anybody was where, but yeah, there was some. It was quite the match. Scott Hall came out for a promo. He did his survey, and he left. And by the way, I should add, after Hennig sat on his face, got out of the ring, Hennig's all pissed off, and Rick Rude's got the biggest smile on his face. And he goes over, and he congratulates Hennig, and then Hennig gets a big smile on his face. I thought, look at these two assholes. They're awesome. (laughs) We had this week's embarrassing Nitro Party clips. I got to say one thing about Hall, too. So as noted earlier in the show, Hall comes out and he does a babyface promo. He puts over the town. They all cheer. He gets his cheap pop. And then he says, who's here for the WCW? Who's here for the NWO? Blah, blah, blah. And then he leaves. And I'm like, what in the fuck is going on? This guy is supposed to be one of your top heels, and every week he comes out and does a babyface promo. What's happening here? And I thought, for years, we have seen mainstream media writers talk about how stupid wrestling is. And our obvious immediate reaction is, hey, fuck you, we love wrestling. But the more I think about it, wrestling's really stupid sometimes. It really is. I'm not saying I don't love it. But, like, especially as I go back and watch this stuff in the 90s, and you see what people, what the, what the media was writing about wrestling in the 90s, and we all got so defensive about it. Now here I am looking back, pretending I'm a casual fan, just watching the shows every week, and I'm like, look at all this stupid shit. Like, week after week, 
gold dust, all this bullshit on Nitro. It's like stupid shit every single week. They were right. And Buff Bagwell versus Lex Luger. Buff is a fun Dr. Seuss promo about all the places Lex can't beat him. And then Lex comes out and they're doing the match. And they give Norton interferes right away to give uh, Buff the advantage. And he keeps the advantage until he misses the blockbuster. And Lex just runs wild, takes out Norton, puts the Bagwell on the rack, and gets a submission win. Yeah. So they had this whole story about how Bagwell had Lex's number. And Lex couldn't get the win, and then the night after Starcade, they just wrap it up on Raw or on Nitro. You know, they didn't get the usual reaction for Luger that he got in a lot of places. I don't know what it was. Maybe they're just getting over him now because it's just ever since he lost that title to Hogan, it's just he's just doing stuff. He did the goddamn laziest power slam I've ever seen in my life in this match. Did you see that? I can't say I noticed. Of course you didn't. Because he didn't go to the ground with it. The guy came <laughs> off the ropes, and he spun him around in a power slam and, and just stayed on his feet. So, yeah, Lex wins, and he cuts a promo to the camera saying Macho Man is next on his list. Maybe Lex watched Sting the night before and thought, yeah, I'm doing too much. <laughs> well, Sting and Hogan came out for their match, and somebody did something to light a fire under these guys. Because it was a million times better than the, night, the match the night before. Yeah, it was like after the restart. And I'm watching this, and Sting's a house of fire, and Hogan's just a giant dick heel getting his ass kicked, but then also cheating to fight back, and it's this fun brawl back and forth. And Hogan misses the big leg this time, and Sting takes over, he's going for his finish. And then out of nowhere, the ref gets bumped, and the show ends. <laughs> yeah. This pissed me off more than Starcade. <laughs> Think about this all of those a- times that they've come on TV. Last week, Eric, when he's doing the thing for Hogan, goes, eh, let's just do a third hour. How many times have they said, we will stay on the air no matter what? We're going to go until this match wraps up. They've had three-hour show after three-hour show after three-hour show. And I remember when I turned this on, I'm like, hey, this is only a two-hour show. What the hell? And I watch it. There's the main event. And literally, Sting, it's a stinger splash. And Tony Schiavone goes, we're out of time! I was like, what? You're out of time? What are you talking about? And then they were off the air. So I guess what happened was, Thunder's debuting. And so this was their cliffhanger for Thunder, where they were going to show you the rest of the match. Where, in fact, fact, after the referee got bumped, Nick Patrick ran in and did a legit fast count this time. He didn't fuck it up this time. And then Sting kicked out of that one, and then they did some other stuff, and the referee woke up, and Sting ended up winning and retaining the title. But I guess they wanted to record a fast count so that they could use it forever when recapping Starcade. Do you remember them doing this? I, I do not recall that. Of ever course happened. not, because it's WCW. They were bombarded with angry calls from Vinny's the next day. Well, that was the show. There you go. That's your follow up to Starcade, everybody. That was your follow up to the biggest WCW pay per view of all time. The show went off the air in the middle of a rematch. To build to Thunder. Which they did not mention one time on Nitro, by the way. Didn't even hint of it. No, I heard nothing about Thunder. Maybe there were commercials I didn't see that they edited off the the network version. But I didn't see one thing about Thunder here on this show. But yeah, it's debuting. And sadly, it's not on the WWE Network. Oh, what a shame. Yeah. Yeah. 